What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. He asked us to do a site survey. Can you kind of go over all the locations, this location, and all the locations we have and see where our guys are and give us your assessment? So we start doing that, and they were putting snipers up in a clock tower. And it's like you've been watching Saving Private Ryan too much, you know? Like you, <laughs> It's not a good place to put a sniper. Contrary to popular belief, you don't put snipers in clock towers, right? And Why is that? Because they're easy to pick off up there? Yeah, you're stuck up there, yeah. right? You're stuck up there, one tank rolling through, takes care of everything. I mean, you've seen that. And saving Private Ryan, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know why everybody thinks that's a thing. That guy actually, he was a cool character in that movie, but he got blown away by a tank because he's up in a bell tower or whatever. In that last podcast we just did about Israel, I forgot to give a shout out to our boy, mutual friend, Sean Ryan. He oh. did two awesome episodes with you. So everyone, make sure you go check them out. I'll put those links in the description as well. But you had done one like three four weeks into the ukraine conflict in 2022 right after you got back so you you were on the ground there like immediately huh yeah we went um the the whole reason it happened and, and obviously this is on sean's show um that first podcast i did was a friend of mine is from ukraine he's part of my jiu-jitsu academy um and the whole build up leading up to the thing he was worried and you know this built up for a little while before and I just would check in with them, and the kind of the the day that everything kicked off, I had said to him, checked in with him again, but I had said to him, "Hey, let's go shooting. Let's go to the range and and get some training in." He he's you know from Ukraine, but he's a new. He was a new American. Was getting into his concealed carry and all this kind of stuff. I was teaching him how to shoot a little bit, and. Um, so we went to the range, kind of burned some hours on a Saturday, get his phone, his head out of the phone, off the TV, that kind of thing. And, you know, it's February in Chicago, so it's freezing, and we're standing out in the parking lot, and he goes, I think I'm just going to go back to see my family. He hadn't, he hadn't been back in 11 years or whatever, and he wanted to go back. And I just, you know, I said, look, it was right then and there. I didn't even think twice about it. I just said, you can't go back. You have no experience. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what the situation is. I said, let me see if I can get somebody, some people, and and help get you back there and bring you back here safely. And I had no plan. <laughs> I had no plan. We weren't the Overwatch Foundation, so I didn't have even kind of like an apparatus or an infrastructure to do this. What work had you done as uh, with in the context of what was pre Overwatch, but like some of that work? Yeah, so we helped out with the the Afghan stuff, the Afghan right. pullout stuff, and then we went to um, Hurricane Ida, two trips to Hurricane oh, yeah. Ida, and then when we got back from that hurricane, we had done a couple of trips up to the military base in Wisconsin, Fort McCoy, Wisconsin where they were housing a lot of these Afghans and, and, and we, we kind of worked with that big army and the State Department there and, and just kind of doing some stuff up there with everything that was going on with that mess. Um, but we were at that point after that was when I got with my business partner and kind of said, look, maybe we could put a something together. Like I didn't even know what it was, right? I didn't know anything about the nonprofit world. I didn't know how we would maybe structure this whole thing but i said we're showing that we can help people and we have good guys that are really eager to do this kind of stuff and for not knowing that we're what we're doing we're okay at it and we definitely could learn and get better and maybe we build this out and create something so we were it was just an idea we, we never we're just kind of roughly talking about it um and then when yuri wanted to go back I just grabbed another uh, recon marine and I just said, hey, will you go with me? And he was like, yes. And I kind of was surprised because I put some feelers out and it's kind of hard. Like, hey, do you want to go to Ukraine as soon as possible? And it was very early days in the war. Obviously a crazy situation. It was a major conflict kind of thing. It's it's hard to, you know, I'm not asking anybody if they want to go to like a resort in the Bahamas with me. Yeah. Um, but he just said yes right away. And um, How'd you get in there? We flew to a country in Eastern Europe and drove uh, a whole bunch of hours. Like we, we, when we arrived in Eastern Europe, it was um, like five o'clock in the evening. 
and we had maybe a eight, nine, 10, 11 hour drive because we were had to stop and all this kind of stuff. So we drove all night and we were trying to get to the border. I think I think we got to the border. Poland and Ukraine or? Um, no, not Poland. Um, okay. So we, <laughs> you can get the map and try and figure it gotcha. out. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but yeah, so we, we get to that border and um, it was middle of the night. It was, I can't remember exactly, maybe three o'clock in the morning or something, zero dark 30. And the border was unbelievable. It was a mass exodus. Mm. And there was a whole bunch of cars kind of lined up on the non-Ukrainian side of the border, kind of waiting to receive people, pick people up. There was some vehicles trying to take stuff in, like big trucks and all this early days. Um, And it was cold and it was snowing. And we had a contact in this country that connected us with this driver. He couldn't speak English and we couldn't speak his language. And um, it was crazy. It was just trying to figure this out and, and get yourself ready for this unknown. And we tried we tried talking to some of the border agents and being like, can you let us, here's who we are, here's what we're doing, can we get in? And he's like, look, the camp at the border at the moment is very, very dodgy. Right, mm-hmm. especially at night, there had been some unfortunate c- circumstances, women getting raped and just some crazy stuff going on. It was, as you can imagine, just this almost like a refugee type camp. And um, so he says, you're going to have to wait till the sun comes up and then we'll start letting people in. So we basically just hung out on the side of the road and the poor guy that drove us had to drive us for all these hours. We're stopping, we're doing this. We had stopped on the way and tried to raid as many pharmacies as we could for as many supplies, medical supplies that uh-huh. we could make makeshift IFAX or whatever. We don't want to go empty handed. So we're stopping in all these pharmacies and all these roadside pharmacies. Were you afraid you weren't going to be able to bring that stuff across the border though? No. Maybe I'm overthinking it. No, like they I, don't... no, I figured we, you know, what do you have in the boxes? I mean, look, we were the only, we were the only idiots trying to get into the country. <laughs> it wasn't like there was a big light. We, it was like it was us yeah. and, you know, a couple of stray dogs or something thinking there was food on the other side. I don't know, right? It was us. Alessi, there's a Vice video on YouTube. I'm, I'm just remembering this from when that war broke out. I don't know if you can look for it, but like in, on YouTube, <clears throat> a Ukrainian Ukrainian border crisis, Vice, something like that. Mm. Let's see if we got it. But I, I've seen... I'm picturing in my head some of the imagery I've seen of what you're talking about. And yeah, it is everyone else coming out of that country, not in, I don't know if we'll be able to get it, but yeah. And we, and we were trying to get in. So, so it was very yeah. crazy. Yeah. Anyway. All right. I'm and, sorry. Um, Keep going. And so this, this poor guy drove us all the way up and the intent was that we had set it up to where he was going to get a hotel, uh, a, a bit away from the, the border in one of those border towns and spend the night before he drove all the way back to where to where he's kind of from. And um, so he was thinking, this has been a long drive because we we're making him stop and then we're hungry and we're trying to sort this out. And we didn't really have a time hack to get there. I mean, we could have taken our time, but we didn't know that at the time, mm-hmm. obviously. And uh, we just told him, I mean, it was freezing cold. We told him, you know, all right, we're going to go talk to these guys. Yuri gets out and, and, and talks to the guys, comes back to the car. It's like, yeah, we need this guy to stay with us because he has a car and it's freezing cold and we have to spend the night on the side of this road, this dark road in the middle of nowhere mm. and um, and wait to cross. And he was not happy about that, this guy, <laughs> right? And so he was kind of voluntold to stay with us and, and all did, that kind uh, of stuff. Did Ben Franklin make him feel better? Yeah, no. I mean, he we took care of him, but we didn't extra take care of him. Uh, That's part of the deal, right? Like that's part you, of the deal. You, your job is to get us there. What happens in between getting us there and us actually getting there? That's all included. It's, <laughs> it's all. It's inc- not like a cheap border day. I don't know. <laughs> it's all inclusive <laughs> at that point, right? Um, but no, he did a fantastic job, and you know he wasn't cut out for for it. It's not kind of his thing, you know. If, <laughs> if if you ask our guys to do anything. They reached down and they, I mean, they've done it all, right? And but this guy was just a regular guy, and um, so yeah, so we did that, and we ended up crossing. And when we crossed, again, it's cold. We're carrying everything we have, like you know, a pack on your back, 
and a box on the front <laughs> to um, full of all these makeshift supplies. We were going to, you know, kind of fabricate these IFACs. We just didn't want to go empty handed again. And um, we just start crossing the border. We do all the checks and then we're just wandering around kind of at the border area because we were waiting for someone, as you can't make this up, someone in a blue van to come and pick us up. And we're walking and it's kind of like, you know how borders kind of have that no man's land area where nothing's really happening. It's just kind of white space, just a yes. big open space kind of thing. So we're kind of there and there's snow everywhere, three inches of snow and it's and it's snowing and it's just cold and it's early, early morning and we're exhausted and everything and we're just waiting and I'm like, Yuri's obviously tried to coordinate some of this stuff with some Ukrainian guys and I'm like, we're waiting on a, a blue van. I'm like... I'm I'm wandering in Eastern Europe into Ukraine in the middle of the kickoff of this massive war and I'm waiting for some guy who I don't know to pick me up in a blue van. Mm. It's like, okay, well, where is this guy? We're just wandering. We see this little guard shack and we're, we're just walking past it and this guy kind of is like, hey, <laughs> we're like, what the heck is this guy doing in this? I mean, it was, why there was someone in there, I have no idea. And so Yuri starts talking to him and he's like, let me see your papers kind of thing. And he must be thinking like, who the heck are these guys, you know? And uh, and so we're like, all right, well, where do we go next? He just kind of pointed and he's like, just go that way to Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> and we, like none of us really said anything to him because what are you going to say? It's like, okay. So we just kept walking. Well, sure enough, the, the blue van rolls up and the door opens and we just hop in. And, and then that was it. We, you know... The, the guy ended up being, um, this guy, Sasha, he's an incredible guy. He now lives, um, we moved him and his family to Chicago and he, and he lives, he, he lives in, in our area now. Whoa. But what he had done is he had set up this kind of like community underground kind of humanitarian organization, like a charity fund where people in that community could just get together and help support the guys on the front lines with gear or, or all kinds of stuff. Um, and, and it was like early days. They had just, they had just mobilized this thing and kicked it up. Obviously, I think the day we got there, they had started it the day before, but when we went in there, it looked, it looked like something out of a movie. It looked like we, when we walked in, it looked like this thing had been running for years. It was so well done, people moving in every direction, stuff getting moved in, stuff getting moved out. They had security guys. They had, I mean, it was, it was dizzy walking in there, you know, and that was kind of our first thing. And he kind of was very well known in that town that Yuri was from. And um, it got to the local army colonel. He was in charge of kind of like in the U.S., what we have is called MEPS. It's like Military Enlistment Processing Station. It's kind of when you enlist, you go there to kind of get all your, you get poked, prodded, sign this, do that, all this kind of stuff. He kind of had one of the, he was in charge of one of those. It was like a regional kind of office for, for that. But it had been turned very quickly into, it's now a hardened military base. And, you know, the guys that were coming into the military were going to be charged with defending their town mm. kind of thing. And they had set up some fighting positions and, and just different stuff, fortified this and, and sorted out that. And this guy asked if we would meet with him. So we said, sure, right? And so we went in and we meet with him and he was a colonel, right? Colonel in the army. So sitting in this guy's office and the vibe was they kind of needed help, but we didn't really know how to talk to him. And I don't mean just the language barrier. I mean, I don't, I'd, I'd never done this before. Right. right. I was in the military a bunch of years. Very, I mean, I never sat down with colonels and had discussions over things like this. Right. I mean, if a colonel, a battalion commander level is talking to you or above, you're, you're, it's, you know, you're not talking to me kind of thing about anything planning wise or anything. And he didn't really know how to talk to us. Obviously, he knew there were these two Marines in there in his town and, and it was just kind of let's see what the deal was. And, and I kind of, was tired and, and just didn't know if it was going to be a waste of time or not. And, and, you know, Zach and I, Zach, Zach's an incredible Marine. He, um, you know, just 
he's very down to earth, very calculated, very um, quiet guy, but just an incredible, incredible, you know, recon marine sniper. He's just, he's just amazing. And I'm very just kick you square in the face kind of thing. So we, we, it, this, this turned into like a good cop, bad cop thing <laughs> when it went, as, as we, as we went down the line. But, um, I was kind of like, I want to see if there's any real purpose for us to be here. And I just start firing off questions that I shouldn't have been asking just because I wanted to see how receptive this guy was. And if we were actually if, like, what's going on, right? We had no thoughts of going and training anybody or we just wanted to know what the deal was. And we're going back and forth. And I actually started asking him about troop movements and stuff like that. And he did the right thing. He basically was like, not getting into that. So I was like, okay, well, at least he kind of knows what he's talking about. Because if he started being like, oh, this, that, and the next yeah, thing. Yeah, shit. Yeah, or he's just, it's just going to be too, it's just going to be too wild or too, you know, it's just not a good vibe, right? If I'm going to, if we're going to try and do something, I want to know your head's on straight. And because um, I don't have to do this. My job's to babysit Yuri for a week or eight days or whatever and get him back home, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. That, that was the whole purpose of going. There was nothing else kind of, we were learning this on the go, right? Now, what, I'm just thinking of like the earliest days of the war. I can't remember. I mean, we all saw the pictures or videos from Kiev and, mm -hmm. and from outside there and how they were trying to mobilize to get down towards Odessa. But, you know, Ukraine's a big, wide country. It's yeah. not like they were everywhere day one. It's like the size of Texas, yeah. Yeah, so you guys are, without revealing your location, you guys are... West of Kiev. Yes, you're somewhere away from the main part of it, it, you can just, you can smell that there's something up in the air, obviously. Yeah, but they, they were freaking out. I mean, they had this town. So so what happened was, and th this is a good example of, of, of illustrating where their heads were at, was um, he asked us to do a site survey. Can you kind of go over all the locations, this location and all the locations we have and see where our guys are and, and see what we've done and give us your assessment? No problem. So we start doing that. You need bunk. You need sandbags here. You need to not do that there. We'd go into different adjacent structures that they had kind of commandeered from the town. And I mean, at one point they had a guy in every window, like every window. And we're looking at that and they had, you know, you need to move this kind of machine gun position 50 yards that way or, you know, whatever. They just, something's off, something's really done. They had... They were putting snipers up in a clock tower. It's like you've been mm. watching Saving Private Ryan too much, you know. Like you, <laughs> it's not a good place to put a sniper. Contrary to pop popular belief, you don't put snipers in clock towers, right? Um, Why is that? Because they're easy to pick off up there. Yeah, you're stuck up there. Yeah, right. You're stuck up there. One tank rolling through takes care of everything. I mean, you've seen that in Saving Private Ryan, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know why everybody thinks that's a thing. That guy actually, he was a cool character in that that movie, but he got blown away by a tank because he's up in right. a bell tower or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so they had all this stuff and, and we just kind of told them, you know, Hey, you're going to burn these guys out. It's early days. And, and, you know, there's nobody right on your doorstep right now. So you, you don't have to be this, you know, you can move into this kind of stuff. Um, and so he kind of liked that. So he left us with one of his majors and said, he'll do the rest of the stuff and, and come back and see him in the afternoon. So we did that. And when we went back, long story short, he says, look, I'm a tank commander. The major, he's an artillery commander. We now have all these infantry guys, and we don't know anything about this. We don't know anything about small unit tactics. We don't know anything about, you know, trying to get guys trained up or anything like this. Can you help us? And we kind of just said yes. We just were like, sure, yeah, we'll help you. I mean, that's our thing. We know shoot, move, communicate. We know how we do that, right? And it's very basic stuff. You need to teach these guys, obviously. So sure, we'll do that. We're going to be here the next eight, nine days. No problem. Okay, come back at 08 tomorrow. Does your underwear get uncomfortable? Too tight? Riding up your groin? Or even your well, I have the solution for you. The sponsor of today's show, Sheath Underwear. Sheath makes the most comfortable boxer briefs on the market. In fact, I'm wearing a pair of my sheath underwear right as we speak. It's my favorite boxer brief I've ever worn. Go get yourself one pair, just one pair, and I promise you it's going to change your life. In addition to their insane comfort, Sheath's stretchy fabric is made out of a moisture-wicking technology, which means that sweat doesn't absorb into the fabric and give you swamp 
We all know what that feels like. Instead, it moves to the outer layers and dries. The bottom line is your underwear will stay cool, super soft, and comfortable at all times. So what are you waiting for? Go hit that sheath link in my description, use promo code Julian, and get 20% off the best pair of briefs you'll ever wear. Once again, that's promo code Julian, J-U-L-I-A-N, to get 20% off your favorite new underwear today. We work out some of the details, and then we get back to where we were staying. And it was like, is this legal? Like, can we do this? You know, like, can we actually, is this allowed? Like, are we going to get home and there's going to be like ninjas coming out of the ceiling tiles to, <laughs> to, to roll us up or whatever? Like, I, I mean, I don't know. I've, we, we both had done like foreign internal defense, like trained, trained with and trained foreign militaries. Um, but that obviously was in a official military right. capacity. Right. But are you worried? I mean, you're talking about training here. <clears throat> But this is a burgeoning opening up war. Like, are you worried about the potential context of, like, if something went really wrong and, like, one of you got shot or one of you shot someone else for some reason? Like, if you got too close to the battle and then there's potentially an international issue because an American's on there? No. Um, no. I, that never crossed my mind. I don't know if at that time Zelensky was, had created the foreign legion or anything like that i think it was very early they did that i i just can't remember in my head if that was a thing while we were like before we were there the first couple of days or if it came after but no i mean that thought never crossed crossed my mind i mean you know if anything came in that town our plan was to leave mm right was to leave um we weren't going to stay there and try and take up arms or do anything like that it's nothing to do with me and i can't take you know i can't take on a whole russian army by myself yeah. right i mean yeah. it's not gonna work out i mean i think i'm i'm pretty dangerous at a cocktail party but i mean i'm not <laughs> i'm not ready to go ramble and you know uh, and and zach neither i mean our plan was anything really goes crazy we do what we need to do but we're we're out right and we're we're maybe taking at that point it's just is is yuri's family coming with us and how are we going to do that and you know that kind of was the plan um so yeah we never once thought like anything like that and we show up we show up the next day to start the training with these guys now here's what happened the war started like if i remember correctly end of the week end of the week it and the thursday yeah and so that weekend, from, from when it started until, like, we were there early the next week, um, 200,000-plus people had voluntarily joined the Ukrainian army. Now, their army, prior to this conflict, was not very well trained, not very big relative to the threat that they have, um, and, and very underfunded, and just depleted in general, dilapidated hmm. in general, because many of the politicians in the Ukrainian government had been in bed with Russia, Correct. different business ventures, and obviously the whole kind of blurred lines in the East with, yeah, they're not us, but we're not them, but we're, yeah, I mean, that's a whole other story. And we'll probably get to it. Donbass and all yes. that. Yeah, yeah, we'll get we'll get yeah. to that and kind of how, how that, that the politics with inside Ukraine affect all of this. But, um, you know, the military is very weak, so they're not able to handle that much intake, number one. It, it, was, it was amazing, Julian. It was like to see that, to see that many people stepping up when your country gets invaded like that, it was a beautiful thing to, to hear and see and to, to, be, to be immersed in. Right? right, that this was going on because you have these, I always say the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker just going down and signing their name, you know, and, and yeah, it was, uh, that was amazing. But at the same time, you're the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. It's not, you know, we've talked about this previously. You cannot just pick up a rifle and go to war. Right. And I, and I wouldn't advise trying either to try and prove me wrong. You can't do it, believe me. But you said 200, around 200,000 people sign up right away. Yes. So it's not like... <laughs> It's not like they're prepared to hand out 200,000 uniforms and get them marching in line. These are people fighting in, in civilian clothing so on we, streets, trench warfare, no? So we show up the next day, and I kid you not, you know um, the movie The Mighty Ducks? 
Yes. And Emilio Estevez pulls up and he gets out the limo and the team's standing in front of him <laughs> and they're just a bag, like ragtag group of shit bags. Yeah. That's literally what happened, right? You had guys there, you know, I call it the Eastern European tuxedo. They had the <laughs> the, the Adidas sweatpants with yep. a leather jacket and the yep. polo shirt on underneath and, you know, the, the, the running shoes or whatever. And it's just like, oh my goodness, you know. <laughs> And, and everything in between, there was old guys, like really old guys. I mean, there was fathers and sons and it was, it was amazing, but we just kind of looked and it was like, all right, um, we'll work with this. <laughs> this, is, this is what we have. Let me stretch out my hamstrings here, you know, and guys, obviously not in physical shape. I mean, just guys that are not soldiers. And had no ambitions or no, you know, they were not trying to be soldiers. But now they're soldiers, right? And so just kind of looking at that, we're like, all right, well, let's just see what they can do. Like, let's see, can they walk? Like, no shit, can they walk? Can they walk in a straight line, like a ranger <laughs> file? Or can they, you know, can they do, can they hold a weapon? Like, can they hold a weapon? And that was the other thing, probably less than, probably about half of them had weapons, maybe less than half of them had weapons. Some of them, you were using sticks off a tree or like yeah. two liter water bottles to simulate. Yeah, we saw a video. Can we find a video of that? Ukrainians. I have videos. Ukrainian yeah. soldiers using wooden guns to practice. I oh, this, was, this wasn't even wooden It wasn't guns. even that. You're this was, a, less, this was yeah. a stick off a tree. Yeah, I remember seeing these videos like, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it was, it was, uh, it was pretty wild and... And yeah, that's how it started. We started teaching them just very basic, you know, school of infantry type tactics, you know, how, again, basic patrolling. Um, yeah. Yeah, not even that, man. See, that's we'll fancy. Put, we'll put that in the corner. That, that's still. fancy in the corner there with that wooden rifle. Like I'm, I'm talking a stick off a tree. <laughs> you know, and I, I could show, I could send you some stuff too. I could sh send you videos oh and pictures, but I mean, yeah, not even that. At least that, maybe you could get some fam familiarity of actually handling the weapon as far as where you would put your hands. I mean, that's not a two liter Pepsi bottle. No, that's what our guys were using, and that's um, crazy. Yeah, yeah, and then, now, but th this is so early on. Y you know, obviously, the country is going to be getting support. It was pretty clear right away, mm -hmm. but like. What did you have any idea what the timeline of weaponry was oh, going to be to arrive? No, I was going to say no, just... and I, th I think we had asked kind of like, "Hey, this is day one, no problem. You have what you have, but um, you know, we're going to be here the rest of the week. What are the chances?" And blah blah. blah. And there was some rumblings of, "Hey, maybe this, maybe that." So you didn't have any access to weaponry at this point, did you? We could have got some stuff if we really needed it. Like, I'm talking you and your guys. We could have got some stuff if we needed it. But you didn't get it. No. You taught, no. Them, you taught them without like, weapons. Yeah, well, we used the, the weapons they did have. Okay, all right. Yeah, all right. yeah, like yeah we used, some of them we, Some of them had some stuff, okay. yeah. Um, but again, it was like everybody had some different variant of the AK platform. Um, and, you know, the AK platform in general in, in different parts of the world, it's like, what the heck is this? It's like just a... Yeah. You know, they're they're it's not the not the best of gear for sure. And um yeah, we just started training them. So like, you know, two man rushes, team rushes, like how to move and how to like move in coordination with each other. So if you need to move and shoot, you're not shooting each other, right? Um and you can actually get from where you are to the place that you're trying to go tactically using movement and fire to cover your movement and and trying to build that out um, to get them to a point where they could actually f be functional. Um, patrolling, simple patrolling, you know, just columns, you know, walking in a, in a, in, a, in columns or a ranger file, like a single, a single file type patrol and kind of just um, covering concealment, basic stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like, Hey, a bush can conceal you, but it's not going to stop a bullet. Like, this is where we were with these guys. Um, I keep picturing like Mel Gibson and the Patriot training all those guys. Oh, and, and it was, you know, the dynamic was great because <laughs> here, here's the thing. And I'll, and I'll illustrate this in terms of how we do it in the Marine Corps. You enlist in the Marine Corps. And let's say you're going to be an infantryman, infantry soldier. That's going to be your job. You go to basic training for three months, right? 
at the end of that, you're a basic, basically trained Marine. Like you've basically just earned a title of Marine. From then you go on to the school of infantry, which is another two months where you learn the basics of, of being a war fighter, a little bit of shooting, a little bit of moving, a little bit of communicating. And when you get done with that, you, you know, you're not going to trip over your own two feet. You kind of know how to run different, um, or not run them, but you know how to function in different patrols and different formations and, and you know how to set an ambush, you know, counter ambush some stuff, but it's very basic level, right? You've done it a little bit in an urban environment. You've done it, you know, in a woodland environment. Um, you've done long kind of marches with weight on your back. I mean, you're basic, basic, basic. Then you go to say, say you're going to be an infantry unit. You would go to that unit and you're the low man in a fire team and you're learning, right? Mm -hmm. Fire hose type stuff. So you're looking at that and, and you're saying just to get to that point to where you can be the least trained guy in your actual unit, you're talking it's five, six months, right? We had to do this with these guys in a week. And not only that, in basic training, you're learning discipline. You're getting to the point where you're at a decent level of physical fitness and that continues obviously, um, like a manageable level of physical fitness, right? And um, you haven't even started at the end of basic training, any kind of long humps, like any kind of long marches with weight on your back or anything. It's just kind of you're physically fit. Um, and you're disciplined and, and you kind of have this military mindset that you're beginning to develop at the mm -hmm. end of that, which is very important along with everyone else. These guys had none of that. They had no discipline. They had, and so we didn't have time to break them down and build them back up. Like Marine Corps basic training is very good at taking some idiot 18-year-old, making him not an idiot 18-year-old and turning him into a U.S. Marine that can then become an incredible warfighter, right? At this point, do you still have a limit on the days you're planning on doing this? We, like know, we're, we know we're only going to be there for like nine days total, so eight days left. Wow. Right. And so we know that. And so Zach and I's talk was like amongst each other was we don't have time. Like, and we knew we didn't have to break them down too much. They already were pretty broken down with, mm. but they just didn't have that discipline. They didn't have, and there's no way we could instill in them the gravity of what was going on. They kind of knew from as much as you'd know if your country got invaded and you're the local mechanic and now this is kind of on your doorstep and you're being affected by it. But then now you're in the army and you're going to have to one day go do something. You can't, you can't put that to them in sure. eight days. And so we just tried to do the best we could with them. And we got them to a pretty decent level in that amount of time. And it was, it was good. He played bad cop because I said, look, I'll just get into their, you know, I'll get into their assholes and, and chew them up a little bit whenever they're slacking off or they're like, if I teach you something, doesn't matter what I teach you there's time that you need to learn that thing. It could be you get it on your first try. It could be you get it on your fourth try. And, and even if you get it, whatever, whatever repetition you get it, let's say, to whatever we define that as, you're still not good at it. You just kind of, you might got lucky, but you did it correctly, right? And you might not know the why, you might not understand, but like you did it. We didn't have time for everyone to take six reps to get there. And so it's like, you need to be paying attention and you need to be plugged into this. You can't be thinking about going home and banging your wife, or you can't be thinking about dinner, or you can't be thinking about the air raid sirens going off. You have to be totally immersed in this. Cause, and, 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 you know, and I was the one like, I don't have to be here. I've already done this, you know, and I can help you, but if you're going to be a, bag of ass, what am I wasting my time for? I'll go back to Yuri's house and drink tea and hang out in Ukraine for the next couple of days and make sure he's good to go, right? And 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 meet his family and all this kind of stuff. So and and Zach played the good cop and it was it was really good. Well I mean for for not doing this before and being thrown into it. And look, we we had taught at various levels throughout our careers of doing different stuff. I obviously have a instructor background from, you know, what I do now with jujitsu and all this kind of stuff. So you know, teaching people stuff that we could do in our sleep was not difficult. It was the dy the whole dynamic of everything else, the environment and the language barrier and just everything else. And, and poor Yuri, it's like, all right, Yuri, here's what we need for you. You now have to be this incredible interpre in, in, interpreter on a subject matter that you know nothing oh, about. Oh, shit. Yeah, you got that going on too. Yes. Oof. 
because he he's never been in the military and he did outstanding it was incredible i could you couldn't have written it any better but i'm saying like you you have to you gotta get the language interpreted and everything to these guys mm -hmm. is it yeah you don't speak ukrainian yeah and i have i have some funny videos of that kind of stuff as well but um, they can tell when you're angry and not oh well, yeah and that, that's it right and and that's it and look i had no problem getting in guys faces and a lot of that was like I'm, I'm Mickey Mouse compared to what you're gonna go do. Right. You can't handle me yelling at you for a couple of days. Like you could have just mailed it in and been like, "I'll take this guy chewing me out for six no. more days." You know? what, what does that look like when you do this? So you get in a guy's <laughs> face, you start saying, "Motherfucker, get in line!" And yeah. then does Yuri walk up and say in Ukrainian, "Like motherfucker, get in line!" Yeah, or is he, he like, uh, "He says motherfucker, get in line." He, yeah, he <laughs> tried. He tries to match my. I mean, he got. He's so good at, at this now. <laughs> Um, and he's so good now because he understands the tactics. I mean, you know, kind of getting a little bit off on a tangent, but when we go and do training trips and we're working together, our teams are working together, we take, he goes with us and he's involved in like, Yuri, here's how you do a, a fucking L-shaped ambush, right? And he's, he's a, so he, he could, we, we have a joke. He could go and be some drill instructor in Ukraine right now and teach them <laughs> our tactics by himself. He knows how to do it now. You know, he's, do, he's done it all these times. Um, and he really, he, you know, we'd get back every night, debrief a little bit, you know, we're, we're kind of having some whiskey and eating food and, and he's asking questions now. Okay, this and that. And then you could see he was really plugged in and he really was, you know, because it meant something to him, obviously. Oh yeah. These are his townspeople. Now, yes. you know, and when he left, you know, Yuri now is, I mean, he was, he was a teenager when he left, you know what I mean? And so this is little Yuri coming back and, and he's, he has this thing now where he's like affecting the war effort in the town he's from. It was. How many years since he left? 11 years it was. Wow. You know, and, and, and some, a lot wow. of people would just be walking in the street and kind of, he'd stop somebody that he knew and be like, do you remember me? And they're like. No, and, he's, and he would tell them and they would like freak out that they remember him, you know, and Yuri's a tall guy. He's like six, seven, I think, six, six. Oh, shit. Oh, he's a huge guy. Yeah, he's, he's so tall. Um, so, yeah, just so so we did this um, and we got the guys to a decent level and part of it in too. Eight, in eight days. Yeah, I mean, look, they weren't, I, you know. They weren't special forces, but. Yeah, yeah. but they weren't even, they weren't good. They just weren't as bad as they were. So they might not get. Yeah. yeah, and so we, you know, and, and what we would do is we would train those guys and then later on in the day when, when they needed a break and we got done with them, we would go and we would kind of work and, and figure out what we could do in, on the, in that humanitarian group, the, the charity group that they had built. And, and we did some amazing things there. We developed, there was a team of seamstresses there I talk about in Sean, on the Sean Ryan show where this woman had a team of seamstresses and Zach actually had um, some experience. Zach got hurt real bad in the Marine Corps. He was fast roping out of a helicopter with one of those big saws, the, the saws that you see in the movies, like Jaws of Life type saws. Yeah. And he fell off the rope, helicopter movie, fell off the rope. His, his, uh, you can watch, you can watch the video. It's horrendous video. He basically falls 30, 40 feet. Wait, the video of this exists? Of Zach falling out of the helicopter? Yeah. Like Blackburn style and Black Hawk down. Where's the video? On his Instagram. What's his Instagram? Oh, I'll have to, I'll get it to you on one of the breaks. It's, okay. a, it's a long right. tag. But um, yeah, he fell out of the helicopter and landed back first on the deck of a ship. Um, He fell out of the helicopter, landed on his back on the deck of a ship on the saw. And so he got heart, had recovery. I don't know exactly. He lived. Holy oh, shit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Zach, you're not killing Zach. Um, <laughs> Apparently no, not. You're not killing that guy. And um, he, I, I don't know when in relation to this next thing I'm going to say is, but he got into a position where he was on different task elements i'd say that were helping to design gear and give input on kit and gear and, and things like this right for the community um and so he had some experience with gear and so we were trying to come up with um <laughs> trying to come up with well you have all these seamstresses 
kind of connected to this. People were just walking into this place and like, I can do this. How can I help? I can do that. How mm. can I help? I have, I know about this. How can I help? And, um, this woman had this team of seamstresses and we were like, maybe they, she can make, Zach was like, maybe she can make chess rigs. So he comes up with this design and she's like, yeah, I can get a prototype for this in a day or whatever. And so we keep checking back in and, and I knew something was kind of wrong because they kept kind of delaying. And I was like, look, whatever they have, we just need to see it. Right. So they brought it in and it was terrible. It was terrible. Like, I mean, trying to say to a little old Ukrainian lady, like go out and develop a chess rig. <laughs> It's not a normal. It's not, it's not a normal thing, right? It's not a normal request. And of course, Zach's like, "Yeah, we'll have her turning these out, and it'll be great." And you know, and it was way too big of an apple for her to for her to bite. And um, I just kind of had this idea of, well, let's just design a bandolier, like kind of like a three magazines that you would have on a on a, a bandolier. Yeah, so I was I was thinking like if we take like the placard and and for you guys that either are you know military, please forgive me. I'm going to be rudimentary as I explain this to the non-military people, but like a thing that would attach to your plate carrier chest rig that will hold three rifle magazines. Ah, uh, bravo! You've seen them. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. like a placard for for carrying ammunition. But then what we would do is because they don't have gear at this point, they don't have plate carriers, they don't have plates, they don't have chess gear like chess rigs or any kind of deuce gear or h harnesses or anything so if we take that and turn it into a bandolier basically put like a uh strap on it so you could wear it like a man yeah. purse kind of thing yeah. because i did that in iraq when i was when when my team was in a vehicle i was the turret gunner and it was hard to be in the turret with all kinds of gear so i would just take two actual bandoliers, the old school Molly type bandoliers that I had kept from previous gear and I would strap them down on my side. Mm. So, um, and so I could be in the turret and would still have access. Oh, there's Zach. Yeah. So, um, I, I was, let's see, look him up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, is this it? This yep. is the video. This is the video. All right. We'll put it in the corner. So this is the video of him. Falling let's see the here. Oh, wait. Oh. So, so wait, that's the, uh, Oh, that's the, the spoof he made. There's a newer version. No, go up to the top. Go up to the top, up to the top. Um, Did he pin it? Is that why? He may have. No. Oh, there's Zach. Look at him, handsome man. Um, Hold on. See if it, it won't be on his story. You know what I'll do? I'll get the video. So, <laughs> Zach, the other night, it's obviously, we're, get, we're very close here to the um, anniversary of... Um, Black Hawk Down, right? Oh yeah. It just happened last week. Yeah. And so he made a he made a video that he put on a story of him falling out with a helicopter spliced with Blackburn falling out of the helicopter. Oh shit. And so it shows him actually hitting the deck. Um but you could see in that video there, you can use your imagination and see what the rest of that video would have looked like, right? Um Yeah, so there's one there's a raw one you're saying. Yes. This one's just like this one's like the dumb off. the dumb ways to die one. This one is, but yeah, the helicopter just kind of moves and he falls off the rope and yeah, he falls and lands <laughs> on that thing and that's one of those big saws, Oof. and it obviously has messed up his back. He's still having a bunch of issues and and all that kind of stuff with it. But um, God, that looks painful. <laughs> oh, I, I I couldn't even imagine. Oh. Couldn't even imagine. Um, so yeah, so we designed this bandolier and and they still use those bandoliers. Um, you know, and and it was it was kind of cool. We we kind of just drew it up, and and they made them, and so we would go and do that kind of stuff after we were done training the guys. How I think you said this at the beginning, but how many guys approximately were you training this first round? This was probably about a platoon size. Um, so I think it was probably like twenty five guys, twenty five to thirty guys, something like that. And did you have contact with like? the ukrainian military commanders that they were yeah with, be... the, with the colonel and the major the major was there um the major was there every day he wanted to see and i and i said i want your officer there and we would go check in with the colonel every day as well got it so these are the townspeople who were part of those two hundred thousand that signed up from the whole country and then they were assigned to some sort of platoon, military unit yeah right right away and you were basically coming in and taking the training off the hands of yep. their okay yeah 
Now, did their commander speak any English or was no. this, uh, I was going to say, all nope. through a translator too? Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, a couple of them could say hello and all that kind of stuff, but yeah, there was kind of Hello. No, I, th <laughs> I think there was one or one or two guys that spoke English, but a lot of it was kind of like, you know, Yuri was like, oh, maybe he could help me translate. It's like, no, right? Like, I don't know that guy. I don't know, you know, like it's, you just can't. It's like, no, we, we're controlling how this works. Right. Like, we're not, you know, it's great. You can speak English. He's not going to be a help. Where were you crashing during this time? Yuri's house. You were? <laughs> yeah. Yuri. So with his family, I assume, yeah. over there? And he didn't, <laughs> he didn't tell them that he, <laughs> he didn't tell them he was coming until we were 15 minutes away from the house. Well, they probably were happy to see him. They, they were definitely were yeah. happy to see how him. Many, but how big was his family? Um, so it's his mother, his father, his sister, and his, his grandmother. Okay. So it's not like 12 people in there. No, I mean, they, like they had, down. he had some family that were kind of more East that were moving West and, and would stop in and stuff like that. Um, you know, so, but yeah, it was, yeah, it was crazy. We just kind of stayed there and it was good cause we had good food every night. His mother would cook for us every night, you know, big Ukrainian meals and, you know, were it you was, afraid of like air fire coming in um, potentially? No. I mean, so the sirens were going off all the time. Rockets were being detected and all that kind of stuff. Nothing landed. But look, I've been mortared before. Um, you know, we've had uh, all kinds of stuff landing. We, we understand how that works. It's like, you know, if you're hearing impacts, you can tell the distances of how close that stuff is and all that kind of stuff. And and that's actually that actually happened. We were out on the training field one day, and this and it was a beautiful morning, and it's snowing. It's like picturesque, right? Like something out of freaking Narnia. And um, the the siren starts kicking off, and these guys start freaking out, and they start running to go inside the building and all this kind of stuff. And uh, Zach, we both kicked off. Zach actually kicked off, and and it was like, look, what are you doing? Oh, the sirens, the sirens. What are you doing, right? Like, this country's at war. There's going to be sirens. There's going to be worse than sirens. You can't go running every time you hear a siren. We're training, and until we hear impacts that are landing close to us, we're training. And they kind of were like, you know, it was a little bit of reality for them or a little bit more of reality for them, you know, because that was a natural reaction for them. Yeah, it's a natural, and, and I can't put myself in their shoes. It's a natural reaction. At the same time, you know, their, their country, it just goes to show you, like, we, there's things we just can't control. You don't know till you're in that situation because to these guys' credit, at the same time, they're volunteering to fight right. for their country that's being invaded, and they feel they obviously, to their credit, feel that desperation to have to be a part of holding this off, and yet, you know, the first time... You don't know what it's like to get punched in the mouth until you actually do. You I know think, what I mean? I think about the human side of that a lot because obviously I was I was 17 when I enlisted. I was 18 when I went to basic training in the military. And again, you don't know anything. And But I think there's something in our minds that, okay, I've enlisted in the military and I understand what this is. I'm... Maybe I'm not going to do college. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to make this a career. I'm going to do my four years and get, but like I've put some thought into that. I've probably talked about it. I've had conversations with friends or parents or, and I've made this conscious decision. I've went through a lengthy kind of in processing situation. And now I'm about to go start that. Or now I've started that. I'm in basic training after the, the, you know, in, in Marine Corps boot camp, the first night you take a shower Everybody stands in the same shower bay. The drill instructor stands in the middle and he tells you to get your left arm wet. Now get your left arm soapy. Now rinse off your left arm. And so you're doing this. You're sh it's called showering by the numbers. So you're being told what to get wet, what to soap, and what to rinse off. Mm -hmm. And if you are getting the wrong body part wet or the wrong body part soapy, you go back out to the squad bay. You stand in front of your bed, in front of your, in front of your bunk bed, pretty much as naked as the day you're born, you can put underwear on your wet body, no towel, and you just have to stand there till everyone's done showering, right? And so you learn, you do what you're told, when you're told to do it, how you're told to do it, all the way down to that. And you do that for about a week. You do that, you, you shower like that for like a week, right? 
And it's the same with eating. It's the same with how you get dressed. It's the same, you know, inspection before you go to bed. And it's, it's to build this kind of stuff. And so, yeah, you have some reality checks in there when the first guy just like, I'm just going to wash this. And it's like, you know, he gets screamed at and sent to his, and then you go, you go out there and you see him standing there. Still kind of wet, still half soapy. <laughs> you know, and it's like, <laughs> what a sight. Uh, yep. Okay. You know, this is real now. Right. And, um, you know, you have these little things as you tick along in the process that, that keeps you aligned to what you're now doing with your life. These guys never had that. I mean, yes, they understand they've enlisted in the army. They understand their country's been invaded and they're at war and all this kind of stuff. But that all happened in like, you know, two swishes of a cat's tail kind of thing. Like, mm. and, and I just don't think you can process that properly. And so, yeah, you hear these sirens and you just, I mean, I didn't hear an air raid siren until I was in the military for years and I went to Iraq and, you, you know what I mean? Or like things like that, right? You, you hear a warning that there's mortars coming in or something. So I had tons of preparation for military things before that instance ever happened. And yes, you do kind of get like, you do get squirrely about that. But by the end, you know, by the end of say one deployment, you don't care when the air raid siren goes off or you don't care if the mortars are landing, you know, all the way over there and you can even see the end. You're like, okay, it doesn't matter. I'm going get to- Get used to it. Yeah, you just get used to it. Where they had that reaction, but our job at that point was to try and lock them on, right? And, and get it into their head like, that's not a thing anymore, right? For you, your wife can do that. Your mother can do that. They can run for cover when the sirens come. You, that's not your thing anymore, right? You need to continue the mission and, and we're training. And so, yeah, you kind of, we had some of these moments and, and look, it was long days. It was tiring days. We're pushing these guys. They don't have the level of fitness that they need to get the work done. And, you know, we did a good job of, of kind of playing them like an accordion, pushing mm -hmm. them when we needed to push them letting them breathe a little bit when they needed to breathe and then getting right back on the accelerator again. And, you know, we did a really good job. Um, and look, Zach's an incredible professional and, and very experienced and, and, and we just, we just really did a good job and, and the Ukrainians noticed that. And so when we left after that first trip, I remember it was like, Oh man, like I, we both wanted to stay longer. That car ride, which was very, very long, was very, very quiet. Like a lot of reflection and it was like, we could all hear each other's thoughts. You know what I mean? Mm. Like we weren't done and, and we could help more. And, and some of those guys you may never see again. Right. And, and, and some of this was, you know, the head spinning on what else we could do and, and things we could do on the humanitarian side and what we're going to do when we get home. I had talked to my business partner during that trip and, and signed paperwork to create an entity, um, to be the Overwatch Foundation. And then we obviously turned it into a 501c3. Um, and so like all this stuff was happening and it was kind of like, for me, it was like, okay, we're doing this thing now. Right. How much did you, prior to going over there the first time, because like you said, the war had literally just broken out. How much did you know about Ukraine before all this? Not much at all. I had never thought about ever going to Ukraine. <laughs> I, yeah, not much at all. I mean, so, I knew where Ukraine was. I knew right. the history of the country. Right. I knew the Chernobyl stuff. I mean, basic knowledge, you know. Okay. You obviously go over there because of something personal with Yuri mm -hmm. and you wanted to protect him. Cool. But then it, it seems to me, not even seems to me, it, it's obvious. This all happened so fast where like you got there, you have this opportunity Boom, let's do it. The next day, you're a fucking, you know, platoon commander. <laughs> and so a part of me wonders, like, because we'll talk about your career a little later, too. But, like, you know, got out of the military in 2012. Fast forward, you did some contracting. How long after that did you like, do contracting? almost four years. Okay. So call it 2016. Since right. then, no action, right? Yeah, and I kind of, from 2016 until 2020-ish, I'd say. I had basically disconnected myself from the community, the veteran community, mm. from kind of my past life. I just looked at it as, 
you know, I had a bunch of problems that a lot of veterans have, the anger stuff, the just trying to figure out what's next and, and just these common things that, you know, you've had guys on the podcast and we all kind of are starting to hear about and know about some of those same kind of problems where it just is difficult. And, and maybe there was a bunch of help back then available. If there was, I didn't know about it and didn't take advantage of it and didn't even care, you know? And um, so I, I tried to look at it as not closing a chapter in my life and trying to find the next one. I looked at it as closing that book and trying to start a new book. And now the first second you had an opportunity, though, you kind of... No, I had, I had earlier in that year started to kind of reconnect with the community and mm. kind of get back into training a little bit. What and made you want to do that? I don't know. I think I just... I really don't know. I didn't have a... I didn't have a motivation to do it. I didn't think if I do this, maybe maybe something or what. It just it just kind of happened. I came across a couple of people, and it just was very organic how it happened, and and it was it felt okay, it felt right, and and I just kind of was enjoying it, getting back mm -hmm. into the swing of things and training a little bit and helping others and um, who who were interested in that kind of stuff and did learn. You, and, and did he, you did you get a rush out of it? No, no, it kind of was just, it kind of was maybe nostalgic, I guess, mm. right? It kind of was, it kind of just was like, oh, I can do some of these things that I liked about what I used to do, but not have any of the bullshit mm. that goes along with it, whether that's the politics of stuff or just the function of stuff or, or whatever it was, right? It just, there's none of that. There's none of the bad stuff. I can go and I can train or I can link up with a couple other guys or sometimes it's even, it was even just like learning about the community. Like I didn't know that there was this flourishing, budding kind of empowering community of veterans doing things, right? I thought, you just get done and you feel like crap and you have to try and figure the world out. And because you're not with your group anymore, you're not with your guys anymore. Mm -hmm. You're not with that unit anymore that you have to do it on your own. And I didn't know that there were, I didn't know that this was going on. Can I, and it was kind of fueled by the internet, right? Like this group of, and you know, you're, you're involved in it as, as facilitating your podcast and having these guys, these incredible guys on as guests. It's like, I didn't know that this community kind of existed and was functioning the way it does. Um, and, and so seeing that and, and, you know, it kind of just did happen through the internet and social media was kind of starting to really pick up with some of that stuff at that time. And I was like, okay, this is okay. Like this is, this is actually kind of cool. You know, um, I can do the good stuff and not have to deal with any of the, the garbage that goes on and I can find cool people. Right. Mm. Um, and so I was doing that somewhat kind of locally with people around that I, you know, could see in touch and, and go and have experiences with. And so it kind of all happened at the right time. You know what I mean? It yes. kind of it it just crystallized. Yeah. It just kind of was, and it was such a slow thing. There was nothing behind it. There was no objective. There was no, there was no trying to be this veteran guy of doing anything like no podcast, no social media presence with that. It was just me doing activities, let's call it right. Training or, you know, that kind of stuff. And, um, and then all this other stuff, the Afghan pull out and then us having this idea to just go to the hurricane and, and, um, you know, previous to that couple of guys asking, Hey, will you help me train with this? Or will you help me, you know, do this? I'm, I just got this new firearm. Can you help me? And you know, that kind of stuff with on the civilian side, I was like, sure, that would be fun. Right. To help you out. I know you, you don't have any experience with this. I'll help you. And then it all came together. So that's kind of what, that's kind of how all that came. Well, can we actually take a detour and talk a little bit about your, your previous sure, life yeah. to how we got here? Because mm -hmm. that, that's actually like a really good cliffhanger with after the first Ukraine one right there because you've done a lot of work there since. Yeah. But, you know, you were born in Scotland, so you weren't you, – you came here at what age? I was like 10, 11. Okay. 
and you settled in the Chicago area? Yeah, I would spend like most of the school year here. And then my mother, every chance we had a break, she would send us back to Scotland, have a big extended family in Scotland. Mm. Um, so it was really important for us to go back kind of multiple times every year and, and see everybody and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I got involved in the military here because I, um, my uncle was in the, the Black Watch, the uh, very royal prestigious re regiment in the British Army since he was like 16. Um, and I always looked up to him if I would have stayed in Scotland, I probably would have followed his footsteps and joined that unit. Um, and in high school, I had the opportunity to do ROTC, an ROTC program. Uh, it was the first year that my high school was implementing it when I was a freshman. So I got to do all four years. It was Air Force ROTC. And I got involved in the rifle team and the drill team and became, you know, the assistant commander and commander for both of those teams and, and just really liked the whole thing, right? And and was getting into the, I was doing the flight simulator thing that we, mm. a program that we had there and, and all that kind of stuff. And I was just, I, I was trying to, I wanted to be an infantry officer in the Marine Corps and got accepted to a couple of different um, military academies. And I was like kind of leaning towards one. And then I said, you know what? I don't want to wait four years to actually be in the military. I'm just going to enlist. Mm. And so when I was 17, my mother signed the paperwork for me to enlist. And I got my uncle's advice on what should I do? I knew I wanted to be, you know, in some kind of combat role. And I asked my uncle and I, it was basically obviously between the army or the Marine Corps. And he was like, the Marine Corps, I've done some training with the Marines and do that kind of thing. If I was you do that. And so that's the route I went. And that was back at the time where the, the commercial was the Slay and the Dragon and the Dress Blues and all that kind of thing. Mm. So it was the cooler commercial anyway. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, so that was, the, that was the, the route I took. Did you feel a real, like was, obviously like you wanted to do that kind of thing like you were saying, but did you feel a real, by that time of enlistment, like connection to America and what it stood for? I did. And look, I'm from a really kind of poor place in Scotland, right? There's not a lot of opportunity, not a lot of jobs. Um, and, and people really struggle. It's a lot of drugs, a lot of suicide. It's, mm. it's just, it's a, it's the most beautiful place that you'll ever see, but it's, it's tough, right? It's very tough for people. And obviously I, I knew about, I've always been a history buff. So learning about the history of America and what America is and what it stands for and everything, I just totally connected with that and, and, and you know, saw the difference from the country I was from and, and saw what opportunity is at a very young age, right? Um, where I think so many people grow up in America and they, they don't, they hear there's a lot of opportunity, but they don't know what opportunity is because they're mm. just kind of, they're around it that they don't even see it. And... And my whole reason kind of for joining the military was, it was, I know it's cheesy, but it was like my way of giving back to the country for allowing us to come and stay here. Wow. You know, it was, it was important. It was like, I'll go do this, you know? And, and I don't know what that meant. I didn't know if it would just be, I didn't know what it meant. I just was like, I'll go do this and I'm interested in this. And, and I know the history of this organization that I'm going to join I, I mean, I didn't know as well as I know it now, but I knew enough about it that the Marine Corps was a, a serious institution with an incredible history. And, and I was like, okay, I get to go do that, you know? Did you wonder why, because I would imagine like a lot of your normal high school classmates didn't go the military route because it's not like we have a draft or anything here, but did you wonder like as someone who I guess at that point is like six, seven years in the country, you know, and clearly loves being here and the opportunity of it a lot. Did you kind of wonder why some of your friends like took it? Maybe did you think to yourself, they're taking it for granted? They, they, why don't they want to serve? Like I want to serve, like you're trying to give back for being here. But at the same time, like there's, it's what it stands for, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that I, I did kind of think that, I mean, I think being in the ROTC program, I was around a lot of other like-minded people. I was around a lot yeah. of people that did join the military. Yes. Right. And, and every day I was in that, but program. just in that program, no? Right. But I think it kind of insulated me a little more than if I didn't have that program. Mm. You, you know what I mean? Yes. Um, and there were some guys on the other shoe 
there were some guys who were who joined the military but never were in the ROTC program. And that always stuck out to me too. I was like, why? If you're interested in joining the military, you're going to join the military. Why didn't you do the the program? Because it really <laughs> it really helped me. Number one, I got promoted right away. Um, and I had learned all the close quarters drill that, that, that you need to have. And, you know, I was able to have a good position in, in, in boot camp and, and kind of be a leader in, in basic training because of the experience I had had with some of the drill and some of the bearing, military bearing. And, you know, I just kind of had some guys were just completely lost in the sauce, as you can imagine. Right. And, but yeah, I mean, for me, I, I kind of believe that, especially in this country, there should be some kind of national service. And now I know a lot of people are probably, you know, I, I, I could almost like hear the groans coming, <laughs> coming through the internet saying that. I hear why you're saying this, but, man. But that doesn't mean joining the infantry in the army or the Marine Corps, right? National service, there, with this country, there's so many things that young people could do as part of national service. Obviously the military, if you don't want any kind of combat job, you could. There's tons of jobs in the military. You yeah. can hand out, you know, towels at the rec center in the military for two years. Um, or yeah, if you want to, you can take whatever job. You could also work for the post office. You could work for the National Park Service. There, there's so many things that this country. I'm probably leaving out a bunch of ideas that uh, we could have as a national service. But from 18 to 20 years old, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. Absolutely. You're an, you're an absolute idiot. You don't know your elbow from your arsehole. Yep. And, you know, you're going to go waste a couple of years in college and and waste a bunch of money, set yourself up with a bunch of debt. You don't know what you're going to do anyway. You're probably going to switch a major and, and end up spending more money. Getting to, and, and still, you come out of college, you've had zero experience doing anything. You might have worked at Subway or something just to get some spending money on the weekend at college, but you haven't done anything. And, and and you've never done anything for anybody else, usually. Yeah, that's, see, that's the thing. And so having some kind of national service where we take young Americans, male and female, and we're teaching them what the country is and how to serve not only the, the country that gives you all the opportunity, but people that live in that country as well. There, I mean, to me, there's no reason we shouldn't be doing that. I think you have a great case. I, I think about this often and obviously like we didn't have it when I was coming through and we don't have it now. And it's mm -hmm. not like I went in the military or, or even worked at the post office or something like that. But, you know, uh, I was still a complete fucking moron when I was 25, Right. <laughs> you know, and there's, you, you, you look at this, I mean, you and I were talking with Michael and Ron in, right. in between these podcasts and obviously they're from Israel and, and like they've been out of the service for a while. They've been living in America here as citizens. And what did they say? Right. At the snap of a finger, they'll I'll fucking go, go back. They're yeah. ready to go right now. They this love war their is, country. This war, exactly. This because war they is. know what their country is. They know what it means. They, you know, and, and here's the other thing. And this kind of on the back end strengthens my argument is, do you know how many people say to me, and I get this a lot now, I'm, I'm lucky I'm kind of opened up to a whole bunch of people that would never know who I was if it wasn't for the Overwatch podcast like this and, and podcasts like Sean Ryan, where they'll say to me, I was never in the military, but I wish I would have joined. And they're not even really specific about that. They just say, I wish I, I, wish I would have done something. I think, part, you know what? I think part of it is too, <laughs> when, when the people, because I hear that line a lot too. And I've probably, I've probably said that myself at some point, like, because I, I think about stuff like that a lot, but it's also probably like a little bit of a search for meaning. You get something in that that is bigger right. than yourself. Right. And in society now with social media and all these distractions and people comparing themselves with other people and, you know, you have people, it's, it's, a, it's more of a secular time, which is perfectly fine. But, you know, there, there, are these, there are these individual crises that are happening with people going within to try to find things and there's not, they find, they tell themselves there's nothing there. So they, they put something outside and, and put all their force into that. And sometimes it's a lot of times it's not a positive place. Mm -hmm. You know, if you had something like this, it'd be a positive place right. to put that. Well, and not only that, but you're learning a lot about other people. Yes. You know, I mean, I'm sure you'd have, if everybody's doing this, you're going to have a lot of really good people that you can connect with. You're also going to have some shit bags that you're learning to stay away from. 
out in mm-hmm. out in the real world and you're just there's so many learning opportunities that that could come out of something like that on so many levels a, a personal level an interpersonal level a, an interactive level with others and and service and and just there's so much different stuff that you could learn as a young 18 19 20 year old if we had a national service requirement yes. and you know and i mean there really is no excuse there's no excuse for doing it it's not it's not a, i mean look at the national service in israel it's a great program yeah you know and i mean we would still have people that would try and skate out of it and you know we would probably give some provisions for that but whatever if we i think if we had a huge chunk of people that were doing it I think it would only be beneficial to the country. I mean, how can you argue? How can you argue there'd be anything negative to the individual or negative to the country by having that? You'd have to get into semantics to do that, but yeah, I, I, I think, I think it'd be. I, I think something, something in the service of the country. Yeah. Okay. You want to argue it shouldn't be military? Okay. Something would be good, and also it might also like open some eyes up to certain aspects of the college industry that are a racket these days. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Like it's saturated. Let's be honest. You well, know, and even, people feel like that's the only thing they could do. Even this, I mean, the way it goes now, <laughs> it's turning into like a civics discussion, which, right. is, which is great. This is what we do here. But they, um, look, look at now the average American and, you, and you've seen this on the late night spoof segments and all this kind of stuff. The average American you know, I used to say the average American knows nothing outside of LA to New York, <laughs> you know, and, and that's kind of a thing is American ignorance outside of their own country. Now the, the saying needs to be revised. And even there's a massive subsect to that that doesn't know New York to LA either. Right. Yeah, I mean, about like New York to Philly. <laughs> and then, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> New York to New Jersey is the extent of stuff, but it's like, uh, yeah. you know, people don't understand how their government works. Yeah. They don't understand, you know, I mean, whatever, national service could be you work in some local political office, stuff in envelopes or, or learning about this. Right. I mean, you, you, you take, I mean, I, I don't know what it is for this state, but in Illinois, you take the constitution test when you're in eighth grade. So you have to study for that a little bit. And then after that, there's no more requirement for you to be involved in any kind of, you know, American civics type. In eighth grade, you're 13 years old and you're going to vote five years later. You know, I mean, it, it just gets into, we, there's so much loss. Like there's people right now that think that the politicians are the leaders of the country. It's like, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, they might tell you that they're a leader. It's like, hello, you know what you are? You're an employee yeah. of us. Like yeah. you work for us. And, and not I, too much leadership happening. And, and I always say to people, I said, if you don't like what the politicians are doing, you can fire your politician. You're like, how can you do that? Vote for somebody else. <laughs> like, how do you not understand how this works? <laughs> right. And, and so whatever, I think if we did some stuff where there was some kind of something, like you said, something, and this country is so big and there's so many creative people here, we could come up with all kinds of ideas. Sure. It doesn't have to be military, but right. we, we'd see a big change in the culture of America if we had that. I think that also you talk about the lack of civics, for example, in mm-hmm. schools and, and in our school systems. I wonder about the mistakes that just kind of compound year in, year out with these school programs and stuff that we do it's not just civics but like basic basic skills and stuff like they don't teach that in schools right it's almost like they want people and i'm not saying they do i'm saying that the end result makes people think they want people to be like ignorant of stuff you know and that's not that's not american i mean that's not good look at something simple as well like look at taxis right now first of all first of all this country was founded on I'm, I don't mean less taxation as far as dollar amounts, but less issues with taxation than what we have right now, like by a by a long shot, right? Because it's so complicated. Exactly. Yeah. And so taxes now to the point you don't learn about it in school. Nope. The only thing you're probably taught is take your take your papers to somebody at the end of the year and they'll do it for you. So you're still not even trying to learn the process yourself so that you even have a grasp of what you're doing. 
when it comes to that and what's going on in your state and what's uh, from a tax perspective and what's going on in the country from a tax perspective and what changed year to year or administration to administration. Mm -hmm. You're losing those little lessons because most people turn in their tax papers and the one question they ask at the end is, how much money am I getting back? And, or, you know, I have the people that say to me, oh, I got all this money back on my taxes. I'm like, you're an idiot. You gave the government an interest-free loan for the better part of this year. <laughs> they, they wouldn't do that to you or they wouldn't do that for you. And you just did that for them. Yeah. Right. And, and they don't understand the concept. And so, you know, I, and I, you know, there's the, the tinfoil hat stuff is, is this all purposeful? Yeah, I, I tend, and it's some people think this is like a cold take. I, I tend to think a lot of it isn't. I think I think when you get groups of people with systems that are in place, they don't want to change it up because it's too much work and no one stops the other people from doing it and it continues on down the line and spirals. Yeah. I, I think that's just human nature. Yeah, I don't think it's purposeful, but I think it's obviously very convenient for the people that it benefits. Absolutely. <laughs> so they're oh, not, yeah. so not going to change that, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, they, that's what I'm saying. There's yeah. not like an incentive no. to like go in and be like, all right, let's burn the house down. Right. You know what I mean? Because also all these people, including the people who aren't voted to office... They work for people who are. Yes. And so at the top of every food chain you see, whether it's in the courts, whether it's in the bureaucracies, whether it's in the agency, whatever it is, there's somebody on a motherfucking Tuesday in November who's going to be running commercials for two months on Sundays during football and on Mondays during the six o'clock news, whoever the fuck still watches that to say, vote for me because we did ba 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 right. And if they can't say ba 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 with number, 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 they're fucked. Right. So if they take a risk to improve something long term, God forbid we did something like that, in the short term, what happens? They get fucked They're and out. they get voted out of office. Yeah. That's yeah. the problem with our system. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So anyway, whoever's listening that has a power to change this, start some kind of national <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but so anyway, so you go in at, you said you enlisted at 18 and you're done training at 19? No, no, I enlisted at 17. My parents signed for me and I went in at 18. I went okay. in June, okay. June of 2000. And, um, and then, you know, my military career was nothing like, nothing spectacular as far as like individual doing anything crazy. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not Kyle Morgan or DJ Shipley or, or well, that's a high bar. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, both of those guys, uh, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to know both of them and they're just both incredible yeah, human crazy, beings. Yeah, you know? great podcast with and, Sean. And, and, yeah. and Kyle, yeah, Kyle's, Kyle's an incredible human being. Um. And his story is, I mean, it's, it's a very, very tragic video game basically. Right. Um, mm. so, but yeah, so, um, you know, went to Iraq, you know, was, was honored and, and fortunate, I say, to be able to participate in, in combat and in a major, a major war. Were you um, there for Operation Iraqi Freedom? Yeah. At the very beginning? Yeah, I was there in, um. 2004 2005 okay so right i was after. there during like fallujah 2 and all of that kind of stuff um and what were you doing uh we were we were very very active very very busy we were kind of in the area where the zarqawi network was functioning and flourishing and um you know after our work up to go it just kind of turned into it was a hornet's nest got woken up and it just was hot and heavy like it was every day something going on so you were chasing how's it going yeah our whole area was this where is... his whole guys were running everything did you know ryan tate ryan tate i mean i know there's a lot of marines but i i had him on the podcast he's an amazing guy who i should definitely connect you with yeah. because i know you're looking to do some stuff in africa he runs that organization vet paw oh i in think africa. You were, were you telling me i yeah, think i told yeah. you on the phone yeah. about this but Ryan was a Marine. He was in Afghanistan and then Iraq, and he was chasing out a in Iraq. It was, it was intense. Now that was when, that was like right before we got out of right? Yes, and I actually, I chased them too. This was badass. So we have this vehicle checkpoint and out of nowhere and it comes in on the radio and then there are Amtrak tanks, the amphibious tanks, just flying over the Euphrates River. Yeah, it was, that was a crazy time. It was, you know, there was so much, um, you know, we, we lost a, 
ton of guys. We we, mm. we did a lot of amazing things. I mean, one thing I, I like to talk about is we were there during the first Iraqi elections. And, um, you know, there obviously was a, a heavy, heavy time and these people came out to vote and the, there was no mail-in ballots in Iraq, right? And this was the first time they could vote and they had to dip their finger in the ink. You've probably seen the famous, you know, fingers, the blue fingers, purple fingers. And so the, the, the terrorists kept attacking the polling stations and, you know, we were defending polling stations and, and, and helping those people and all this and, you know, trying to repel some of that stuff and, and to see those people that are getting mortared and, and, and rockets and all that kind of stuff still stand in line because this is their chance to vote. It was like, oh man, heavy, yeah. heavy, heavy, like part of history. And then that night we got to take, it was like middle of the night, we got to take the guy with the, the handcuff briefcase with the results of the election from our area, we had to run him up to Baghdad in the middle of the night to deliver that stuff. Was that hand shaking a little bit? Oh, he was shaking. <laughs> yeah, he was. And I remember we come out, you know, and we're getting all briefed up and we're getting all ready to go and locked and loaded and all that. And he was sitting in our vehicle and I'm up in the turret and he's kind of down to my right. And I, and he was scared, you know, yeah, I, no I, shit. I, he, he, he was, he was very, very scared. And, I remember, you know, I'm sitting up in the turret, I'm getting myself sorted out and ready to go and all this kind of stuff. And I could hear the jingle <laughs> of the, of the, you know, the little <laughs> chain on the, on the handcuff thing. I was like, oh man. And, 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 you know, it was, it was a very uneventful trip. We were kind of preparing for the, the worst. I mean, back at that time as well, that was when the whole roadside bomb and, and, um, you know, the, the big IEDs and the, yeah. the V beds, the, the vehicle borne IEDs, it was such a massive thing. And, and it was all the time it was, yeah. and in our area, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't go outside the wire without there being IEDs somewhere. It was just, it was a, a really heavy time, but yeah, we made it all the way up there. You know, we did it kind of late for that purpose. Um, you know, and, and, and it was kind of uneventful, uh, to, to take those, to take that guy back up there. Um, but yeah, that was a pretty cool kind of mission that we had was, was doing that. And yeah, I mean, we had some, some big involved in some, some big battles, you know, a bunch, we lost a bunch of guys. Like I said, some guys did some amazing things. It just was, um, it was, it was something I'll never forget, obviously. And I'm, it's, it's one of those things where it has caused me a lot of, not issues, but it's, it, it sticks with you, right? Yeah. And when you're that young and you come back from combat and you hear the story now countless times, I remember we'd come back and you're on this kind of downtime and it's like, okay, go see doctors, go see head shrinkers, go do this. And if you just kind of say like, I'm okay, everything's good. Nope, nothing hurts. You can be done by noon and you can go to the to, to the beach and drink beer or whatever, right? Like you're, you get done for the day because you're not working. There's nothing to do and you're just waiting to kind of go home or whatever. And, um, and everybody kind of did that. Everybody was just kind of like, nope, everyone's okay. We're young, dumb, bulletproof, you know, like all of that kind of stuff. And, and, and then it's because you just don't know. And, and you don't think because you've done that stuff and you've, you know, you've returned fire, you've, you know, you've done this, you've done that, you've kicked indoors at three in the morning, you've all these kind of things that you've done on, on a heavy combat deployment like that in that kind of role, you just kind of think it's part of the job, but it's not normal for humans to do that stuff. It's not yeah. normal. Right. And, yeah. and you train for it because you have to be able to get through it, but that's it. The training is just. The training is just to give you the capability to actually be able to do it, but it Not doesn't, handle it. it doesn't stop at that. Right. Yeah. I mean, then you go home and then this happens or then this happens to your friend or, you know, there's, and, and you just, you, you, you could drive yourself. I mean, look, people have, people have done all kinds of terrible things, um, based on these silent things that happen after the fact that they don't think anybody knows. They think they're on an Island and, and it's, and, and nobody kind of helps you with that. And sure, I'm sure even back when I was that young, there were resources, but I wasn't going to ask for them. Right. I, I wasn't going to ask for that. I wasn't going to do that because of the stigma of it, or I probably wasn't even thinking of it. You know what I mean? And now I hope there is a, a huge kind of 
learning lessons that have been done through 20 years of, uh, you know, Iraq. And, and because of, of stories like, you know, Kyle's and, and, and DJ's and, and Zach's and, and, you know, myself and, and everybody else that we know of Sean Ryan and, and everybody else that's been, been had participated in this, the names go on and on and the stories go on and on. Hopefully as a, as a, massive military we've learned those lessons and it's like look he's not showing any signs of anything but he needs to go do this he's not showing any signs of anything but he needs to go do that and and get people from day one into those kind of channels to to deal with some of that stuff because it does you know i'm one of the lucky ones sean <laughs> sean's story is incredible sean, yes. sean's one of the lucky ones kyle is one of the lucky ones the shit the shit i mean i talked a lot with sean I'm yeah i'm a lot off camera but I was really, and I, I could say this about a bunch of people I've had in as well, not just military guys, but I was really grateful for how much of an open book he was yeah. when, when, when he came in here. With and me it's hard to, to do that. It. It's hard, man. When you're in Baghdad in that time period, you could just hear the car bombs going off all day, all night, hear the gunshots, hear the gunfights, and it was just bombs, terrorists, suicide bombers all the time people coming back off up seeing these vehicles getting blown up seeing what's left of them if anything i mean it was this guy died this guy died this guy died this guy died and, and that's why we were so busy we were killing these guys that were making the bombs we were killing the guys that were planting the bombs we were killing the guys that were detonating the bombs and it was saving american lives I can't, I can't imagine it's hard know? it's hard to do it and i'm i'm gonna be open and i'm also not gonna be open Right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's very difficult to do that. Um, and, and the thing that gets me now being in the community and, and being able to connect with some of these people is just how many people went through that kind of stuff. And, and, and they all say the same thing when they're going through it, they think it's just them. I yeah. thought it's just me. And so you were conscious of it early. No, I wasn't. I, I mean, I knew I had a lot of problems. Yeah, you weren't making it sound like it, but that yeah, did. no. Now I'm saying. Now I look and okay. I and I can see that. You know, it's like I wish I knew back then that everybody else was feeling how I was feeling. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I said that wrong. Then I'm saying you were at least conscious that you were feeling a certain type of way right away. You just bottled it up. Um. Yeah. yeah well, I knew I was feeling a certain type of way. I didn't really bottle it up. I kind of was very angry. I was very violent person. I was very like. But you, you weren't know. asking for help. No, 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 no. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I could, I could ruin any kind of friendship or relationship or anything in a second, and not care. I was very violent and very, you know, I had no patience. You know, I, I'd go from zero to a hundred just in half a second and not think twice. You know, and and and. You can't function like that in no. society and, and you don't know why. And, and, you know, I never, I never did any drugs. I've, I've still never done any drugs. I just, it never was for me. Um, I don't knock anybody that does any kind of drugs. It just was never for me. I never got into pills. You know, there probably were times where I drank too much, but I never had like a problem. I never was like alcoholic or anything like that at all. Right. Um, but for me, it was the anger and it was just kind of the, not giving a fuck about anybody or anything and, and just kind of, kind of having that. It was just such a weird thing. And, and it was, it was so hard to relate to anybody because nobody acted like me. Because remember at that time I took myself out of any kind of connection to any veterans groups or the community or people. And so I really was on an Island, right? By myself. And and maybe if I was staying connected to people who were similar to me, maybe I would have seen that they also maybe were like that. And maybe that could have helped me get on the path of something or it would illuminate something in, in me. But I couldn't see. All I knew was I was different than everybody else and I couldn't figure it out. And, and nobody in society acted like me. So you're talking about, I want to make sure I'm straight here because I, I try to keep a timeline of like, people in my head and and when they're telling me their story and what they went through and when they went through it but it sounds like based on what you just said you are specifically really referring to that 
at, at least post twenty twelve, but probably post twenty sixteen period, rather than immediately post like no, e even before. Yeah, I mean, I'd say after after kind of the initial, I'd say after kind of that initial heavy heavy deployment and combat exposure and that grind and and kind of not being able to not being able to separate from that or not being able to turn that off or not being able to to kind of see anything outside of that it just i just felt very alone as mm -hmm. far as like the island i was on or the lane i was in and and yeah that just kind of affected every part of my life you know and then I didn't want to, when I got done in the military, I didn't want to, everybody was doing kind of like the stuff that, that Sean did, for example, where like, okay, you're going to contract some way and go back mm -hmm. to the Middle East, right? For whoever, right? A company, an agency or whatever, some kind of contracting and get you back to the Middle East. That was the hot thing at the time. I didn't want to do that. And so I took a contract doing stuff in, um, Mexico and Central America and it was like a surveillance thing um and and it was good I liked it it was a lot of singleton type stuff it was very interesting it was kind of a lot of stuff in Mexico at the kind of budding of what is now the cartel mm. stuff problem yeah. um it wasn't anything like it is now but it was just a lot of kind of activity down there and, and doing stuff down there and various other places, but kind of centered around that. And I loved it, but it didn't really help me with anything. And I, there kind of was no future in it. Right. Cause you're just, I mean, contract and there's not really a future unless you're just going to keep doing it. Yeah. Um, and, it, and I wasn't happy. I still was having all kinds of problems and the schedule for it was kind of crazy and erratic. It was, it was tough to plan anything. It was kind of go, go, go all the time. If you were on something, you didn't know how long you were going to be on it for. You didn't really know how long you were going to have a break for. It was just, it was all over the place. And I was trying to get a life together. I was trying to, I was trying to move on past all of that stuff. And mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, I'm not going to really do it with a schedule like this. And, and then that's kind of when I decided like, let's just try and get away from all of that. And then he continued to struggle because now it's like, now I'm trying to function in real, the real world with real normal people. And I don't feel like I'm normal, <laughs> you yeah. know? And, and so how do I, how do I do that? And, and tried a whole bunch of stuff and, and, you know, and, and so eventually just kind of what I did to pull myself out of it was I said, look, I don't have anything that I'm living by. I'm just, mm. and I'm struggling, like I'm struggling. I'm angry and, and then I'm even more angry and then somehow I'm even more angry and I'm taking that out on everybody. And it's just, it's hitting, it's hitting people close to me. It's hitting family and friends. It's hitting the guy standing in front of me in the grocery store. I like, everybody's feeling this, right? Like it doesn't matter. Like it's, I'm the dragon and you're all getting the fire kind of thing. Just, you know. And so I decided to kind of plug into my faith and, and find something to live for, just to find a purpose and to find a, I'm very good. I'm a very analytical person. Like I said, I'm very into history. I'm, I'm that kind of thing. And I said, look, if I can, if I can align myself to this and I can really learn what this is and what it means to me, not what it means to you or not what it means to some guy who's in charge of some group or anything. like, let me look at it for mm -hmm. me um, and explore it kind of that way. And I chose to look at, you know, my faith through language history and context right and so i learned the language of the bible i you know hebrew i learned um the history of the bible like how it relates to real history um and then the context of of what actually was happening at the time politically socially all that kind of stuff to why this part is what it is hmm. not what it means now not looking at it say us sitting here in 2023, how can I relate this to my life today? It wasn't written for our life today. It mm. wasn't. And it wasn't written in 2023. And so when this was written, what did it mean to the people who wrote it? Mm. Right? And why? Because there is a lot of political implications for what was happening that day. There were a lot of different sects of people that were functioning within that society. 
there was internal struggles between what this guy believed and that guy believed, even though they believed the same thing. And a lot of that stuff, when you illuminate it, to me, it means that's alive now. That's a living thing. It's not me listening to some guy put some spin about how I can relate it to, to my life today, right? right? What I need to do and or what I've done is I've taken what this meant to their life at that time and then taken that how it applies to me. I haven't taken what that says and applied it to me. How did that function in the time it was written for the guy who wrote it to the people they wrote it to? And how can I somehow learn from that? You're truly putting yourself in their shoes. Yeah, I'm not reading it like they wrote it for me. Mm. And I think many people make that mistake because then it could be totally open. I can take something that was written 2,000 years ago, right? Or that happened 2,000 years ago, and I can bend it and twist it. And oh, mold, fuck yeah. I can mold it any way I want to my 2023 life, yep. right? And that's not what that was intended for. And so um, it, that's really helped me, and it's given me something, you know, it's endless learning, um, and and it's it's kind of difficult. It's hard to speak to people about that because – most of the West, if they look at that book, they don't look at it through that view, right? Like, look at Christianity. Christianity has 39,000 official sects. 39,000. It's a lot. How, how can you take something and split it up 39,000 different ways? Time. It just... But they, but okay, so then what do we do with that, right? Like, how do you figure that out? And Judaism has much of the same kind of thing. So to me, it's not about that. It's about, okay, if I was alive when this thing was written or when people were talking about this, how would I view it? How would the guy next to me view it, you know? And then now, how can I apply that? And that's really worked for me. And that really helped me because kind of immersing myself in that really, 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 helped me and and I learned how to I learned how to just interact better you know because now I want to interact with people that can answer questions I have or can help me do this or can and so it just it, that that really helped me and that really kind of turned things around I know right when now when did that happen around like 2016 17 mm. um and, and sense, right? But those kind of early days of that, 16, 17, 18, I'd Right say. in line with the disconnect. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that really helped me kind of just build myself again, you know, um, and, and get something under me that I could stand on. And it's very funny. I mean, and I'm, and I'm not slighting anybody that said this. Everybody's experience is their own experience. And, and, and really, I always say, like, I don't really care what you believe. And I don't care how you believe it. I don't try and evangelize anybody or convince anybody of anything. I, I mean, I don't care what you, I, I mean, what am I going to do? Twist your arm till you say okay, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. I could do that. I'm pretty decent. I'll bet you could. Yeah. I feel like you could. But um, Stay on that side of the table. <laughs> but, but some people have this story of these weird things happening to them and everything, some like big sign in their life and all this. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody wants to have that Abraham or Moses moment, mm -hmm. right? But look, Abraham was one man in the entire world. Moses was one man in the entire world. You're not Abraham and you're not Moses. And if you're sitting there saying that this guy, that guy, or this guy appeared to you in the shower while you're washing your <laughs> nutsack and told you how to change your life, I, I'd be sure about that yeah. before you base your life off of it. Yeah. Or you have some dream and, and or something happens where a leaf falls off the tree and lands in the right thing and it showed you some sign. That's great. And if that really happened to you, fantastic. But just make sure that happens to you. Make sure it really did happen like that because you're not Abraham and you're not Moses. And, and remember, at that time when Abraham was alive and Moses was alive and that stuff was happening and a bunch of other examples, they were that one guy and it didn't happen to everybody. Every, no, not everybody had that Abraham experience or that Moses or whatever right. the case is. And so I, I would just say, like, be careful of that kind of stuff, you know. Um, but if that really did happen to you, it's nothing for me to say it didn't. Just make sure, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think people, it's similar to what we were talking about a little bit ago in another context. People, 
you know, they're always looking for something bigger than themselves, something that subliminally explains what's on the other side and the reason why they're here on this side and, and for the time being. And, you know, where people, where people find peace in things, I'll respect. Yes. But I'm the same as you. It's like when you start bringing it on to everyone else in, in a forcible way, and we've seen this when it gets bastardized in the worst way. Right. It's, it gets a bit annoying. And it's like, okay, stop. But I'm glad you found that. I'm glad that you had your own very, as you point out, very personal, relaxed, individual, unplugged from everything experience to kind of create a, a, a fountain to unleash your emotions. Yeah, and I, and I mean, I didn't, again, I didn't plan for that. I just know I needed something and, and I really didn't know what else to do, right? And it was like, well, here's something that I know is a thing. I don't, I know a little bit about it. I don't know enough about it, but I know it's a thing. And so let me align myself to something. And that's what I chose because that's what I, you know, I, I mean, I believed to some degree of something at that time. And so I chose that. And look, it doesn't have to be that. I'm not saying if you're, if you're a veteran right now and you're struggling, I'm not saying that. Find God. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe yes. Right. I mean, that worked for me and I'm not saying, you know, the, the, what I did is the answer for you or what anyone else who has a, a good example of, of how they turned their thing around. I'm not saying that's the right example for you either, but what I will say is find something. There is something mm. that will snap you out of this. Right. And maybe it's, maybe it's finding an accountability person. Maybe it's going to the VA. I, I don't, I don't think that'll help you very much, but, <laughs> but maybe, right. I mean, but I mean, maybe it is right. I, I don't know what it is, but my, my advice would be keep trying to find that thing because that thing is there and just don't give up on that. Right. Because there's so many guys that just give up and yeah. they're just not here, you know, and you have to really be careful of that. And it's a real crisis ongoing crisis oh. too with, with the veterans especially in this country and yeah. you know i feel like we talk about it on so many podcasts especially when i have veterans in here but it's i mean that right there is 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 a good piece of advice and and i you know like even when we get people through the podcast we do like reaching out to me we're you know i'm just hosting a podcast here to be clear but like i take that very seriously when people talk about that stuff and it's like i'm not the guy to tell you how you're going to handle this but right. you know i can at least i can take some of the experiences i've heard in here and parrot some of that yeah. and i and i try to do that because i feel like on a, one of the beautiful things that has happened luckily about this podcast is we have some good examples of that so i always <laughs> always appreciate people sharing that kind of thing but you know in in all the in all the kind of underlying causes getting you to that point like You've laid out a bunch now about how you were feeling angry, short with everyone, kind of disconnected from other people who maybe didn't get it, didn't get your experience. And you had talked about a while ago, you had said something about, especially like in 04, 05, when you were going into Iraq, you lost a lot of friends mm -hmm. and a lot of guys over there. So I always kind of wonder, because I, I, I don't have an experience like that at all with my friends and seeing buddies die next to me and or in any kind of situation, let alone war, but like... It, do you think a part of what, you know, could have been an underlying driver of what was happening with you was some sort of survivor's guilt? I don't know. I have, I have, um, and I've talked about this recently to somebody, um, you know, I, I have a, a situation where I've never talked about this, like publicly, publicly. I don't know if I want to, but I, I have a situation where no one... I was in a position and somebody, and it was to do a specific role. I'm going to kind of be vague about this because, because I don't want someone to tell this person. Okay. <laughs> um, and I don't want anyone to figure it out. I was in a position that somebody would always like doing a role during certain missions or ops and somebody always bugged me to be in that position, right? Let's just say it's, I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm making this up. You're not gonna be able to figure out what the situation is, but let's just say there's something that one guy does something, another guy does something, a third guy does. And the third guy wants to just switch and do the thing that the second guy does, right? And I always said no to this person. And sometimes they were asking, come on, 
like, really, let me do it. And sometimes it was just, I'm just going to chance it and ask and see if he'll let me offer this up. Right. And, um, I said, no, all the time, because I took it serious and I was preparing for that. And, and there was a lot going on and it was like, you know, I had to have my, I had to have myself kind of focused on, on what I was going to do and didn't want to be switching stuff at the last second or anything like this. And there was one night I said, yes. And it was weather related and, um, it was raining and it was cold and that thing I would have been wet and cold more than everybody else. And I just probably was in a bad mood and, and just finally was just like, fine. Okay. You can do it. We'll, we'll switch out. Right. And that no shit, this, I mean, I can't tell you how many times this guy asked me and that night I said, okay. And that night we got hit and this guy got very badly injured. He's, he's, you know, he's not, he didn't die, but he got injured, um, injured in a way where it like changed the way his body looks. Right. And, um, and there's, there's a funny story about kind of the medevac and some of the stuff that happened after I'll, t- I'll tell you offline. Cause it is kind of funny. Right. And, and I don't want to tell that side of the story here because it, it, to the people that know it illuminates that story. But for, you know, I've always thought like that was my thing like yeah. that, that should have been me. And I know I shouldn't think like that, you know, I know I shouldn't think like that. And I've talked to a couple of people about this and I know, I know I don't have any kind of thing about, you know, that should have been me and then this that, and the next thing. But I do often think like maybe I would have been able to handle the after of that better than he mm. could have has that kind of, you know what I mean? And so, yeah, you, there are things like that that happen just in that kind of in line of work where you do get stuff like that. You know, I know Kyle has a bunch of, of, of things that he has that kind of linger like that. And I know tons of other guys too. And it's, it is weird because it is silly, right? Like there's no way that that, that happened. Like he asked, I, for that day, I did say yes. That was just another, that was just what was supposed to happen. But then that after thing, you're like, you just, it drives you crazy. Yeah. You know, I mean, even just trying to explain it like this, it it drives you nuts, right? It's like, and so you do think about stuff like that. And, and it's weird because, you know, we had another situation where someone else in like very close got, got, um, got wounded pretty bad. And, uh, long story short, we kind of got a call from the hospital and Baghdad was like, Hey, you need to come get your guy. He's fucking, he's crazy. He's, he's not leaving. He, you know, he needs to go home, but he's not leaving. He's, you know, he's all messed up physically hurt and stuff, but he's not leaving. You guys have to come get him. Like he's Godzilla, King Kong all rolled into one in here. He's not going. So we had to go up, we had to go up and get him. And so he kind of became, and I'm not saying this in a derogatory way. He he obviously was combat ineffective. He couldn't go out on any kind of missions, but he was, he kind of turned into our, like, I'm not saying this derogatory, but like a mascot, like Mm. he was there. He still was with the team. He still was helping facilitate stuff whenever we were, you know, like he was, everything was good to go and he was there and it was great. It was so great. Right. Because he went through a really kind of crazy, um, thing and was really badly injured. And, um, and, and this guy kind of thought the same thing, like, Oh, I almost said his name. He came back. I'll just be able to go back. But obviously this guy, due to the extent of his injuries, needed multiple surgeries and all kinds of stuff. And so I know that affected him too, right? Because this sure. has happened to you. And and now you might be thinking, well, he got to go back. Why don't I? You know, and, and so, and he was always that guy. He loved being, he loved being a Marine. Loved being a Marine. Loved being around other Marines. Always a very motivated guy, funny guy. Um, and so, you, you know, taking the guy from that environment, you just know what that's going to do to that guy. And then having to deal with what happened all by himself and all that. I just, I always thought about that. I've never, I know I've kind of been updated on him. Never tried to reach out to him or talk to him. I wouldn't bring up that scenario 
Mm. Um, obviously about talking about that because there's no need to, right? I, I know that's not a thing. I know that, I know that that should not have been me. I know I don't have survivor's guilt about that, but there's, there's elements of that that pop up in your head. You, you know what I mean? There's, like, there's a twinge or something. Yeah. It, it's yeah. not me sitting around thinking that should have been me and looking at certain body parts or. But you're always going to ask the question a little bit. But yeah, it's in your head for yeah. sure. You know? And so. So yeah, there's, there's that kind of stuff comes up a lot. Um, but here's the thing during all this time that we've just talked about, it's stuff like that, that you're dealing with, with yourself. But I know tons of guys that have that kind of thought now, or that have, you know, things similar to that. And I don't know if I was around them or I was connected to them, or we could share some of those experiences that might have helped. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Instead of sitting around with nobody to talk to that to, like, hey, I have a best friend now that I do a lot of things with, but I can't talk to him about this kind of stuff. Or I have this this woman, or I have this whatever, and I have parents, or but I can't talk to them about that kind of stuff. You know, and, and you and and so you just feel, even though you're surrounded by all these people that love you and know you, function in your life and all that kind of stuff, you just still feel pretty alone. And then you start throwing anger and stuff on top of that. You know, I just, I guess I was just always able to not do anything too bad to myself mm. or with myself. Well, that's good. You, you know, but you hear those tragic stories, you know, I mean. Did you have a family when you retired? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I was terrible, you know, like I wasn't. Mm. You know, I just, I just wasn't a good person to be around. I wasn't a happy person to be around. And then when, if I was, if I was having a good day, that could change in a heartbeat. And then I just totally disconnect. I mean, I had times where we'd be going to an event or a party or something. And I just would, all right, I'm just going home. Like, I just can't do it. I don't want to go. Right. Like, I don't want to go and sit with these people and play bean bags and eat a hot dog and, I just don't want to go. I don't want to talk about the shit that they're going to talk about. I just, we're just going home. And there's no reason, right? There's no reason. Mm. It's just. No reason. There's no reason. It's just how you feel. Yeah. Do you think underlying, like you don't have a reason when it's happening. Maybe it's like you're kind of on, I'm just imagining here. Maybe it's a little bit like you're on cruise control and you just feel this type of way. But do you, do you think maybe some of the underlying thought is like, God damn, all these people have no idea how it really is out there. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Right. I mean, I don't have that now. And, it, and it's That's great. Good. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I'm, I'm a total like 180 from how I was. Um, and it's taken years though, right? Yeah. I mean, much like it has been for everyone else that you talk to and share their stories with some of that stuff. Um, but it's crazy. You don't, you don't see that stuff in the video games. You don't see that stuff in the movies. You know, I mean, there's, um, we were, we were talking earlier about the, the anniversary of Black Hawk Down, obviously was, was this week as we're, filming this and I know like Tom, Tom Satterley's been, you know, the All Secure Foundation. He's been on a couple of podcasts recently talking about, you know, those events. He was there, mm -hmm. a Delta operator and he was there. And it's the same kind of thing. Everybody's story, you have these things and it's just like, yeah, I thought it was just me and I'm going through all this and these huge events that are going on in your life that you just think that Nobody has a connection and, you know, organizations like his are really helping a lot of people, um, you know, build these connections and get through some of that trauma and, and some of those scenarios. And, and it's just, yeah, you just, you just think though, that it was only you yeah. and there's no answers. Like you literally, I'm so lucky I was able to figure it out. But I, I mean, I didn't figure it out. I landed on a solution that worked for me. I didn't mm. know, I, like, I didn't know. Um, but I've been able to kind of turn everything around and I need to be a lot better about sharing some of that so that maybe I can influence others who hear a podcast like this or hear a podcast like some of the other ones that, that you've done or Sean's done or, or Mike Ritland's done or any person that puts veterans on and they share some of this stuff. Um, you know, we always talk about, we have, and we do this with the Overwatch Foundation. We have 20 years of the global war on terror that we, we kind of became as a, as a collective superheroes. We, we, what we did now is writing the new book on war. 
for the future, right? Mm -hmm. Through our lessons learned over that 20 years, we contributed to that. And that's fine on the, you know, on the manual of arms type side or the tactical side or the gear development side, you know, we, we can all kind of throw a little bit in and say that we've contributed to that. What we need to do and what we need to also add to that is the aftermath because we've learned a ton of lessons through that as well. And, and those are probably more important than, um, than the, the tactical stuff or the, the gear stuff. Cause you could argue we had better tactics and better gear than the guys in Vietnam had. They had better tactics and gear than the guys in Korea and then World War II, but we all share the same aftermath. Right. Right. And so developing a new system of how to help each other after the fact should be what we're focused on. And we all kind of have a, a part to play and we can all come on podcasts and share our story of whether it's our nonprofits or our companies or just the story we've had or the things we've done. And we can share little pieces of that and, and get it to the new batch of guys that hopefully never have to go through 20 years of war again. But probably are going to have to, or they're going to do st some stuff, right? Uh, and they can learn those lessons that we had to learn the hard way and avoid some of those pitfalls and, and not add to some of these tragic numbers that we're having after the fact. Well, I think this resource of, of the world we live in now and being able to share these stories and seeing so many people who do is, if, if it's not a solution in and of itself, it is a damn good start. Because I, 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 think, uh, I, I think a lot of guys, and I, I see it not just from some of the people I mentioned earlier who comment who may not have a military background, but not to be lost within that, there are people with military backgrounds who are part of those people who reach out. Yeah. And you kind of wonder, like, damn, if they hadn't heard this guy talk about it that day mm -hmm. in the way he did, yes. that it connected with them in that way, maybe they, maybe they wouldn't have right. even just had the awareness that this is something going on. You know, I'm not saying we're solving their problems. That's takes more than that right but, you know it's 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 important and and i like how you tie in all those other past wars like the major campaigns that we've had in you know modern history with the u.s because you you can hear some of those stories from family members passed down about you know dad or grandpa and some of the things they would do late at night and right. the struggles that they had silently and and you wonder how many how much damage that did to their life and how many years it took off their life in, right. in many cases because, you know, there wasn't this ability to talk about it. And mm -hmm. it's not it's not to be, you know, some people talk about like, well, you know, uh, they're, they're certain, the, the veterans all have, definitely all have something to talk about for sure because of the things they're forced to see. But then other people who aren't in there, you know, sometimes we're just always going straight to trauma with stuff. And yeah, I think that can happen, but looking across society, everyone does deal with some scary things in their life, right? And and I think being able to not just, I'm talking beyond veterans right now, being able to normalize, at least talking about it and 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 getting yourself some some ability to have resources and help for it is is, is huge. So we're, we're always going to do that in here. And, and like I said a little bit ago, I, I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us on, on, on this platform. Yeah. And, and, and thanks for giving me the platform. Right. And, and, you know, I try not to talk about this stuff. I know I probably should do that more, you know, but it, because I think, yeah, it can help people, you know, but I mean, I think there's, I always just kind of think, yeah, there's people better than me that can get this message across, you know, nah. um, when this, unique. when this whole overwatch thing started, I kind of wanted it to be, I want it to be the gray. I wanted it to be totally gray. I didn't want there to be a face of it. I didn't want anything. And then obviously we start learning very quickly about the nonprofit world that you need to raise money and you need to get your story out there. Yes. And somebody needs to do that. And I got voluntold that it was going to be me, which kind of makes sense. I am the one kind of doing it. I'm the, the one driving it. And you're a good I, talker. And too. I, and I have the experience there doing these things. So, yeah. um, you know, I feel I can communicate a wee bit, you know, like I'm you're probably good. not the best. But, no, 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 you're, you're you know, good, man. I'm trying my best. Um, so, yeah, it kind of fits part and parcel. And so I'll develop some of that where I can speak about some of those things more and and, and open up and, and hopefully that helps people. And, you know, because I see in the Overwatch Foundation as well, I mean, we use a lot of, we use all special operations veterans who have done some video game movie style stuff. Right. And, and have had their own struggles and have and have been through it and 
And that's kind of what's so good about what we're doing now. Yes, we're helping in these places, right? And 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 that's amazing. And and some of the stories that have come out of that have been have been fantastic. But we're helping these veterans as well, and they're helping themselves. You know, that getting the, getting guys back together yes. and and small units f- figuring out the problem from top to bottom, and and just being involved in the planning and and you know doing everything. Like I said, the whole spectrum of, of planning this stuff out and hopping on a plane and, and being somewhere in yes. a few hours and, and really, you know, getting your feet on the ground and making a difference, using skills that you developed, you know, in that kind of environment to do that kind of work now to help people, that's been a massive benefit of what we do yeah. with our teams that I never predicted and I never planned for. Well, you are not, for what you're talking about, it's not like you guys have had to or are planning to like go into battle again. So it's not combat. But what are, to spell out what you're saying a step further now, you are given that purpose back to the guys you work with who were in for a long time. Because every veteran I've talked to on this podcast, a, a common theme with like a struggle that happens when they're out is that, they're like, damn, I did something with the highest stakes, life and death, yep. to help people and serve right. my country, of course. Like, that's why I did it. But I'm also, my, my idea, my, the, the best case scenario is that I'm helping people and doing this as hard and as horrible as some of these places I got to be are. And so when you come home and they say, all right, go get a job at fucking State Farm. Right, like you know what I mean, no. like like oh yeah, I'm helping people with their fucking uh, right. policy for their for their homeowners insurance. Save them a hundred and sixty nine dollars. You yeah. can't simulate that. You know what I mean? You can't right. simulate those stakes. You feel. I mean, I've never had to deal with that, but I, based on what these guys tell me, they feel like chained to a desk, even more so, like right. locked up. Like, what the fuck is the point of this? It's and, tough. And and look, I never thought. When, when, when we did finally get around to, to putting some planning together for the Overwatch Foundation on what is going to happen, I didn't plan. We never sat down and said, this is really going to help the guys. This is going to, you know, give them purpose. It's going to do it. It never was a thing yes. until I actually saw it happening. And I saw yeah. these guys light up and I saw, yeah. I saw their ability kick in. And, I, and, you know, we have to do some crazy stuff. We, we have to, I mean, we are in austere environments. We have to take care of our own security. We have to plan different routes. We have to have communications contingencies. We need to have, you know, infill stuff. We need to have exfill stuff. We need, we need backup plans and contingency this. And, you know, we have to build out a lot of these skill sets just to go to a place or a place within a place that it's not like, like right now you and I can hop in the car and go to a mall or go to a restaurant. We don't have to think twice about it. When you're in some of these places that we go to, you have to think about that stuff and you need guys that know what they're doing. And yes, we're not kicking down a door and raiding a bomb maker's house at three in the morning and hopping on a helicopter or anything like that. But some of that stuff that is empowering, that is technical, that is, um, you know, just has that higher level of skill these guys can do with us to help people and the end result is it helps people and it scratches that itch for them. Yeah. And they're not getting that in their regular yeah. lives. And, and so my biggest thing now too, is, you know, we, we're, we're off, we've been able to operate this thing on a very shoestring budget, right? I mean, the Ukraine thing we've done six times. We've, we've, we've upped it. We've upped our game every, every time. And, and that's been a fantastic thing. Cause it's like, you know, and I never tried to outdo the last trip. It always was, we just, it just happened that way. We just move that way because that's what we do, right? We, we did this. We're going to do it better next time. And we don't think about it. It just works out that way. And we build it that way. And we've done it all on a shoestring budget, but eventually I want to build, obviously I want to raise as much money as we can because I see what we can do with limited funds. I can't imagine what it would be like if we had, you know, a lot more funds. It would allow us to do a lot more things, but more importantly, what it would allow us to do is get those guys more involved. Like mm. the worst thing about us going on a trip for me is coming home mm. because I know these guys come back and they're on fire and they're wired up and they're happy and they're, they've just done something great and they're wow. connected. Yeah. And then the letdown that I can't, you know, get. And here's the thing when we go now, it's not six, seven, three, five month deployments. It's, 
we can go, we can do certain things that we do. We can go halfway across the world or to the other side of the world. We can get something done in four or five days and be back. Mm. And so now if you're selling that to a, a spouse or your kids have a baseball schedule, you can fit that in, right? Three, four, five days. Some of the longer things we've done, seven, 17 days. I have guys that I know I can push out that long. I have some guys I know that four or five days is their wheelhouse. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's fine. That's great. They get that. Their family's on board. Their wife's used to seven-month deployments for 17 years, you know. And, and now, oh, you want to go with the boys and go help people for four days? Crack on, right? And, and it just, it's, we can do this, but we obviously need money in the kitty to, to continue it, to keep it going. I, I'd, yeah. love, I'd love to get it to the point where we can have some guys full time and we can be, because, because I see not only the benefit we give to the people that are involved in the mission of helping, you know, I feel, and this is not being cocky or overconfident, our guys can do that in their sleep. And, and we're always going to be able to do that. We, we help a lot of people in, in really cool ways. And, and it's, it's crazy that we're able to do that and allowed to do that. Um, but how much it helps those guys. I mean, I have a guy right now. Oh, I wish I could have him out every day. He would. I, if, I, if I had him, I could send him anywhere in the world and keep him there as long as whatever. And he'd be like a pig in shit, right? <laughs> I mean, he'd love it. Um, and I have some guys that were like, hey, if you come to me every three months and I can go do something for four days or five days, that'd be perfect. And it almost is like, hey, any, you know, you get the text come in on the group chats where, hey, do we have anything going on coming up? I have some time off work or I have this or I have that. And you're just like, oh, I don't have anything coming up right now. Let me, mm -hmm. and it, and, but that does drive me to try and, you know, shake the couch cushions and, and, and get some kind of money to then, okay, I'm, and I'm doing this yes, to, to further what we're doing and, and to add another notch on our belt, but it's like, I'm doing it for this guy who I can see is itching to go do something because I don't know, maybe he's having a bad day and, or, or maybe he just wants that, you know, maybe he's just hungry for it and, and, and motivated for it. So yeah, it's that, that's been probably the biggest, um, unexpected brilliance that's come out of, awesome. of what we do. Yeah. Well, let, let's go back to Ukraine, and yep. because we left off, it was, yeah. it was a good little, that was a great detour there in the middle. Love yeah, that. sorry, thank, sorry, thank you for, sorry for dumping all that no, on that you guys. Was <laughs> fucking awesome, bro. That's so, like a whole podcast in the yeah, middle. I love sorry. It. So, so yeah. So you, we left off where you guys left the first time. Yeah, we you left. come back. You talk to Sean Ryan. How soon do you go back? Yeah, so we went back six weeks later, eight weeks later. Okay. And we raised a bunch of money um, and we bought that, those guys, uniforms, plate carriers and plates. Hmm. And when we decided to do that, I mean, I was heartbroken for those guys. You know, the Marine Corps dress blue uniform, I'm obviously biased, but it's the best uniform in the military, right? Our black uniform with the blue trousers, with the red piping and all that kind of stuff, right? The big white hat, the, the slaying the dragon uniform, it's amazing. And and to put, even to put camis on and you just feel like you're doing the thing, right? To see these guys undertaking what they're about to undertake and not even have a uniform kind of mm. bro broke our hearts, right? Yeah. And so we decided to put that um, together and, and buy them uniforms. And so we went back on the second trip and I took a, a medic with me. And, and I said, okay, your job is going to be to stand up a medical platoon. They were terrible at, med at med medical stuff. Zach and I had given them a couple of kind of TCCC classes and just quick kind of, here's how you stop a bullet wound kind of thing, right? Stop bleeding and all this kind of stuff. How to use a tourniquet on a very basic level. Neither one of us have, you know, our medics. Um, I can stick my finger in, in a bullet hole and throw a tourniquet on you and get you to higher care. That's about as good as I can mm. do um so i said your job and tommy i said tommy your job is to stand up medical platoons like the whole thing from start to finish you no problem and um so we go back and, and we we had that gear we had the um uh ifax as well and we had um this objective of setting up these medical platoons and the way <laughs> the way we picked the guys was we got back and everyone was excited to see us and, and i was like all right, let's see. Because a lot of the guys were the same guys. There was more, 
but a lot of them were the same. I said, okay, let's see if these guys have been training. Mm -hmm. We'll know, right? We'll know if eight weeks later, if you've been working on this or not. Where, where's the front lines at this point? Have they advanced like a lot closer to where you um, guys were? Or? No, they still kind of were in the same area. It's not a very fast moving war, this, right. this thing, and it hasn't been, right? right. Um, and so the way we kind of found the candidates to be the medics, the Ukrainian medics was, we just kind of said, hey, who's interested in doing medical shit? <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hand. And, um, and so it was like, all right, well, that's it. Those guys go with Tommy and, and, and we stood up medical platoons and he's, Tommy's a wizard. He's so good. He's like our medical director. And uh, we have some amazing medics, SEAL medics and, and Green Berets and, and, and just some really high level medics that do a lot of stuff. He's sticking the nasal pharyngeal up and down the guys and, you know, doing chest decompression and, and, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, and we stayed for 17 days. So on that trip, we were able to actually level these guys up again. And we got them to where they were doing like ambushes and counter ambush type stuff. And they had really trained and they had really practiced the basics that Zach and I had given them. And Tommy and I were able to just kind of add to that. And, and they were, they were pretty good. Now, soon after that trip, that was a very successful trip. It was very cool. Soon after that trip, these guys start getting sent to mm. fight, right? And it was like, oh, they've come a long way, but they're not ready. Like not to our standards, sure. they're not ready. Our standards obviously pretty high. But still, I mean, they're fighting against a trained army. Yes. And, and you know, then the, then the after action reports start coming in. And it was kind of cool. It was like, hey, we, uh, we, um, saved this guy's life we saved this guy's leg we you know were able to the the one class we kind of ended on on that was a um was a room clearing class and um just basic like how to walk in a room and not die basically it wasn't any high level direct action cqb anything it was just here's how you go from outside a room and get yourself into that room and, and clear it and, and be able to take care of some stuff. A very basic level, right? Um, for all you internet CQB wizards who have never really done it before. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and it was, you get that message like, hey, that room clearing class saved my life today. You get that text message. I don't never forget, I was sitting eating oatmeal at the kitchen table and that comes across and you're just like, it was Monday morning and it's like, all right, like that's why we did it, man. Well, well and let's yeah. get let's get some more money and let's go back and let's yeah. you know what am I doing sitting here eating oatmeal, right? Like what we're doing is really affecting these people's lives and helping them. What are we doing sitting here? You know, like we need to figure this out. We need to get this funding piece in place and we need to try and do this. Are they getting so when when they're going to the lines now? Obviously, my understanding of it, and correct me where I'm wrong here, but. A lot of the funding, at least the way it's been earmarked that like has come from the West and specifically the US is supposedly going towards weaponry, right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's going to more of the high end stuff, the the high Mars or tanks or okay. or right, yeah. um, you know, some of that kind of stuff. So less the guns put being put in their hands. That's yeah, more I mean, every I, I think there is some of that. I think they kinda have that. But I think it's more javelin type stuff and, you know, armored personnel carriers and big equipment type stuff, I think, is where the majority of that money is going. And you were talking about how this, you just hinted at it a couple of minutes ago, but you and I have been talking off camera about quite literally how this war is being fought oh, in yeah. the trenches, on the street, urban warfare. But I think I'm going to say this wrong, but you mentioned something like they're fighting over the same 10 yards for two weeks. Yeah, they, they, they're not gaining a lot of land, right? It's, it's very bogged down and, and they're just not both sides, not very tactically sound. Um, on the Ukrainian side, we were showing them our way of doing things, right? Even at a basic level, basic ranger handbook type stuff, nothing crazy, but they, they're higher, higher, higher ups. Our units have been able to kind of do what they want. I think they've seen a little bit of a capability in them and they've put them in places to, 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 to do that. But as a whole, the Ukrainian army is fighting with very old tactics, with very old generals who see war very archaically. And 
the higher level battle plans just are not where they should be, mm. right? And and it's just it's very confusing to me because it seems like the small unit tactics thing is working. You know, like the and they want to play these giant tank battles and all this kind of stuff and it's like when the last time was tank warfare against other tanks effective? Like when was that a thing? World War Two? Yeah. Right? I mean we use tanks. My limited knowledge we, we, we stuff, use tanks. We use tanks very well in coordination with light infantry mm. as support, right? I mean, the way the US does war at a very high level is everything exists to support the regular infantry. That's including special operations. Special operations exist to support regular infantry. Everything is built around that, around your regular grunt, right? That's air support, that's naval gunfire, that's you name it. And they seem to have this very segmented, like if we just get tanks, if we just get this, if we can do this, and instead of using small unit tactics with your, your individual team, squads, platoons, whatever it is, and then supporting that effort with all your other assets. It's a pretty simple concept. And it's worked for our country for many years. Um, you know, and you, it sounds kind of silly. You're telling me we take a F-35 jet and that exists to, to, to support that, 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 fire team or that squad of infantry guys. Yes. Yes, it does. The Predator drone exists to support. Yes, it does. Right. That Abrams tank that's, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Yes, it does. So they just have this very archaic way of doing it. But we've seen, especially on the medical side too, very, very good results from our guys. And, you know, on the the third trip, we went back um, and, did, and did a quick trip, more training, then we started training their special operations units. They have a kind of like a, it's, it's like a hostage rescue kind of team. They're not really open war type team. They're called the Cord. And, but they've been tasked now with this. And so we went and we trained them. Um, and they have dogs and stuff. We didn't train the dogs, but we had our guys that were training with the dogs. Um, and, and did that kind of stuff. And that opened us up to their special operations community. And they really liked our training as well. Um, and then on our last trip there, we took eight guys um, and we trained. When was this? This was February okay. of this year. We trained an entire battalion of guys. And, and it was so funny. So how many guys is that? Oh, um, so like three to four platoons. I don't know how many guys they had in their battalion, but it was a huge, it was, it, it's a lot of people. It's a very tough task to train a battalion of, of guys. And we only had eight guys. And, um, and it was a mix of seals and, and Marsoc guys and recon guys and, and green berets and, and this kind of stuff. And it, it was really cool. Um, our team was amazing. We did a workup with Kyle Morgan um, down in oh, wow. down at his training facility. He's kind of helping us a lot on the training stuff because we can all get together and train. Um, and he has a nice training facility and all that kind of stuff. And we can we can take these training trips and get everyone on the same page and and do a quick little spin up to get you know to keep us sharp before we go and actually do it. And when we got there, we were working kind of at the state level with the military, so with the higher brass, right, the higher level. Uh, commanders and um, we show up and we're in this coffee shop and you know everything we had done before was with these either special operations guys or these regular kind of army groups this was like this huge level where we're, we're talking to these higher up brass guys who it's difficult talking to them because they kind of just see things different and so there's kind of a little bit of a standoffish and I said, okay, well, we're here. Introduce yourselves and tell me who you are. And there was guys there from their intelligence services and there's, you know, this, that, and the next thing. And these guys are explaining. So we introduce ourselves and, you know, they see our experience and all this. And then we start talking. We're, okay, we'll do the training. How many, they say, how many guys do you want to train? Or how many guys can you train? And I said, we'll train however. I'm thinking a company or something, <laughs> right? And he's like, well could you do like 50 guys? And I'm like, yeah, we could do 50 guys. Like that's, yeah, sure, 50 guys. I said, but how many guys do you have? 
And he's like, well, we have like a battalion. And I was like, yeah, we could do a battalion. <laughs> and, I, and I had no idea, right? I'm kind of looking at it like, and everybody's kind of sitting there and they're like, hopefully a Ukrainian battalion's a lot different than an American <laughs> battalion, you know? And uh, so we leave that meeting and I said, okay, boys, um, yeah, we'll have to just see how this goes. And so obviously the guys can do anything and we, we split it up and the training we gave them was unbelievable. Like we had split- How long was this one? Eight days, Another eight, eight or nine, okay. yeah, eight or nine. And we had it split up to where we had different periods of instruction and, and different lanes of training. And then at the end, we did like a big end exercise, like a big kind of like war games exercise where we had split them up into like two big units and, and they had to break up into smaller units and, and one group was attacking another group and they were running ops on each other basically and over a quite a decent sized piece of land and and um, had different objectives and they were setting up ambushes and doing raids and, and observing the enemy and reporting. We kind of covered the whole gamut of everything, communication and and it just, it was absolutely fantastic and the, the level that the guys, you know, did it at and and how we got these guys through this training, um, it just was really cool. And they were kind of not newer, they were newer guys. They were a new unit that was- All different ages at this point? Yeah, still? And, and what happened was, so that unit, that battalion that we worked on, because the Ukrainians are taking such heavy losses, they have like scraps of a unit over here, scraps of a unit over there, you know, remnant of a unit over yeah. there. And they had amalgamated all of these remnants to make up a, a new battalion. Uh, what, what, what kind of, you, you're talking about like communications in the field. What kind of communications are they working with? Um, really kind of rudimentary type right. stuff. We took a couple of MARSOC communicators over with us that really, um, spun them up on some high speed stuff, which yeah, was. Yeah, but this is only for like one battalion too. I that's know. the crazy yeah, part. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. I mean, I wish, I wish we could replicate it. Um, and, and. You know, I, I wish, uh, I, again, we just don't have the, if I could get in front of bigger people, we, there, we can do what we want. We have a great network there, but like we could really, and with the guys we have, I have a roster of about 50 guys. I'm nowhere near able to utilize all 50 of those guys. Um, but if you sent me anywhere with 40 to 50 special operations veterans, I could take over the world. Mm. With, these guys could take over the world. Like we, we could, we could do very special things with what they have over there based on our experience already there. We have a track record there. All of our units are doing really well. Um, obviously they've taken losses and that kind of sucks as well. Some guys we've trained and worked with have been killed, right? I mean, it's a, it's war. Yeah. Um, but the guys overall are doing really well and our tactics are working there, which I don't understand why they're not trying to, I'm not saying replicate it because of me or because of us, but I don't know why they're not looking for other strategies and other tactics do we have a ballpark i don't expect you to know the number i don't even know if i expect you to know the answer to this question but do we have a ballpark of at any given one time right now how many soldiers in the field on the field of battle there are for ukraine i don't know i know that they've lost more than double of what they originally had before the war begun in their entire army. Holy shit! How many people? I think I think Can they had. That up, Alessi? We, I think they had about eighty-two thousand in their army before the war started. I believe is what I've heard, and they've lost over two hundred thousand. All right. So this is the previous public estimate by Biden administration, dated back to November twenty twenty-two. U.S. Chairman, yeah. the Joint Chiefs of Staff Mark Milley had estimated that over a hundred thousand soldiers had been killed or wounded on each side since the start of the invasion. He also put the number of Ukrainian civilians killed at 40,000. So I'll that's highlight- a year, That's a year ago. Yeah, these are, well, is that, because it says they dated back to November 22. So is he referring to that's when the estimate ends? Yeah. Can we click the actual Or is that when the estimate's source? from? Can we click that, Leslie? We don't have access to it. Oh, fuck. But, no, no, hit accept. Just accept yeah, things. Just give okay. them, give give them the what they want. Us. Or you can hit reject. <laughs> Breaking down the figures. Can we go up all the way up? Oh, published is, in July. So published in July of right, 2022. This is, yeah, this is from Le Mans. So 
Either way. A yeah, lot. I mean, they, they've had, so they started off at the beginning of the war. The army was estimated around 82,000 people. Crazy, man. Or I think it was their whole military was estimated at 80, which seems small for a population of 44 million, but maybe not. I don't know. Um, and then what about those East regions, though? I don't want to bury that lead because you brought it up earlier. Like, you know what? Here's a bigger question because this is going to tie it in. How do you solve this war? Yeah, I mean, we kind of talked about this. This is where I get hammered on the internet now because I'm supposed to be the, you know, the the Ukrainian love guy. And <laughs> I, 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 so apparently that's Ukrainian been... Ukrainian love that, guy. That's been, that's been <laughs> okay. added to my... I think your I, patriotism for Ukraine has been demonstrated. You can proceed. <laughs> yeah, but it's, no, it's not even... I, I mean, I guess I don't have patriotism for Ukraine, right? But, but here's the thing. I support them in this conflict, right? Obviously. Yes. But here's the deal. They can't, I mean. they can't win the war. And it's very important everybody hears that. Ukraine cannot win this war. Why do you say that? Because they can't. They don't have the manpower. They don't have the experience. They don't have the tactical ability. Um, you know, they've been given a couple hundred billion dollars and not a difference has been made. They've been but they given- haven't lost. They were supposed to lose in two days, no? No, I think all that was kind of the, remember what we've learned in this war also is that Russia can't win this war. And for years, Mm. we've believed that Russia is the superpower and has this incredible army and, oh, the Russians, oh, the Russians. And they've been shown to be a paper tiger. Yeah. They're using civilians in this war right now the same way Ukraine is. And the, the fact of the matter is neither side can win this war in all out military conflict. They can't do it. They can't even get close it's just churn yeah can you you were this is what you were explaining off camera can you explain why that is because like you're saying neither side very specifically neither side can win right because war this is my opinion war needs to be fought by professionals it's not a game it's not as easy as as taking someone with a lot of heart and patriotism and handing them a rifle in a couple of weeks training and and expecting them to do a job to that level, especially mm-hmm. what's going on in this conflict. The reason why we are the best is because of our training. That's it, right? It's training, it's training, it's training. And that's why we're the best. Our budgets for training are massive. Our results in training are incredible. And then how we relate those, how we take that training and apply it on the battlefield it's literally second to none, right? They don't have anything even close to that and they don't have professional soldiers. They just don't have it and they don't have it anymore because a lot of those guys were sent out in the beginning and, you know, God forbid they're gone, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't have a schoolhouse. You know, I'm in talks with some people in Ukraine now who are working to try and create a schoolhouse type thing, training centers, um, for military, like for their military, so that they have actual training programs for the future, right? And it's not going to help them now, really, but for their future of their country, because they need that. We have that. Our, you know, our training apparatus in the in the American military is unbelievable. The yeah. schools and the 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 level of training that we have across all kinds of different capabilities is is amazing and. I think we take that for granted and I don't, I don't think we really notice how big of a deal that is, but when you hold it up to this war, it really stands out. I mean, it would be like if, if the three of us in this room went out and grabbed a few other guys, eight other guys, and then we walked around the neighborhood and found another 11 and we decided to just have a soccer game, Mm. right? How's that game going to look? Ugly. (laughs) It's going to be ugly. Yeah. You know, and we might have a guy that used to play in junior high school, or we might have a guy that wakes up early on a Saturday morning and watches the EPL and can kind of try and throw some strategy together. And we might have a guy with a good left foot, but it's not going to look like a soccer game. And it's definitely not going to be, you know, the the number one versus two in the English English Premier League or, you know, a World Cup final looking soccer game. It's not going to be that. And and to me, that's what war needs to be. It needs to be those higher level kind of, you know, groups or militaries that have professional soldiers and have them, if you're going to have to do war, you have to do it right. 
You know what mm. I mean? And that's just not what's going on. And so it's going to continue to be the steady churn. It's going to be these huge, I mean, look, 200,000 dead on the Ukrainian side. We went, Crazy. now here's some, here's some, here's some perspective. We were in Iraq and Afghanistan yep. in major combat operations for 20 years. What's it, 8,000, 7,000? It's like four and a half thousand people dead. Yeah, Iraq and Afghanistan casualties or deaths, United States. I think it's like four and a half thousand. Either way, point it's taken. Too, it's too many. Yeah. Number one, but it's not 200 fucking thousand. That's fucking insane. And so put that into perspective, right? Let's get those numbers for the... The, yeah, no, those are the countries. We yeah, have those the United are the States. No, no, you type in United States, Iraqi, yeah, let's and see Afghan war casualties. Or deaths, I'm sorry, not casualties. 7,000 at the end. Of, number of United States troops who have died fighting the wars in Iraq 000. and Afghanistan have passed 7,000 at the end of 2019. So, yeah. yeah. It's not, it's not. That's fucking nuts. 200,000. And look. And it's there's been, 46 million people in Ukraine. And it's like been that. what, less than two years? Yeah, yeah. It's been since February, end of February 2022, so less than two years. I mean, that's that's crazy. Imagine, imagine if we had 200,000 dead American troops. Oh, my God. <laughs> what, what would that do to this country? Oh, my God. Please never. But oh Yeah, I mean, God. yeah, and it's it's terrible, right? And And there's no end in sight. There's no... Again, we've given all that money, hundreds of billions of dollars, and it hasn't made a lick of difference. Now, if you want to sit across the table and argue, oh, but it's kept them in it, it's kept them as a well, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's a not a very question. that's not a very good argument though. If it, to me, it gets Russia's to, lost a lot too. Exactly, it's about the same. They're saying it's yeah. very similar yes. numbers, right? So you're talking four hundred thousand people between both countries. Yeah, I mean, look, just on that alone as a neutral. Can we find a way to stop that? Yeah. Like, can we find a way to stop that, right? And and here's the deal. You know why it's continuing? It's because we're paying the bill. And somebody needs to come in, and hopefully whoever the next president is does this, and says, here's the thing. We're going to sit down at a table, and you're going to figure this out. And let him kick and scream and complain and yell about whatever he wants, Zelensky, and just get him told, okay. You want to continue this? Pay for it yourself. And very well, he can't do at, at this point. He's he can't do anything without our permission at this point, just because there's so much. It's just a, it's a follow the money thing. Where's the money? It's here. Yeah, I mean, he's basically that meme right now where the man sneaks up behind his girlfriend and asks <laughs> for something, and she says, "Okay, go get my purse." He's that <laughs> meme, right? <laughs> You know, and, and all the other memes, him floating around in Fort Myers on a dinghy asking for money and all this <laughs> kind of stuff, right? I mean, all those memes are there. Yeah. And, and look, the guy in the beginning of the war was instrumental to his country and, and, and did, a, did a good job. But I don't think he's doing a good job now. And, and I don't think flying around the world every four months with your hand out is a good way to try and win a war. And I don't think that's doing justice to your people, Right. And and here's the but thing: if he can't pay for stuff. And I'm not I, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm just asking as a devil's advocate: if he can't pay for the stuff to finance that war to continue, so that they do continue to exist, you sit down, is, you sit down, and you make a deal, and you're probably going to have to give up right. some kind of land that yeah. you that you haven't had for years anyway, which is disputed. I mean, it's that was Ukrainian land, and, and, and yeah, I mean, it is what it is. Have you spent any time there? No, um, no. I mean, some of our units have and stuff. But it's, uh, <laughs> so it's he's Take pulling, the pulling up the, the Zelensky Save memes. That one. But I mean, you know, sit down and make a deal. And you've had your chance, right? You, you've had your chance. You've had the money. You've had the bullets and the band aids. You've you've given it your best shot. But you've also proven you can't get the job done. You just can't get the job done. And and yeah, they, and he's outperformed what he was supposed to do. I, yes. I I don't think it's he's looking at it. It seems like as an L if they give up. One ounce of land, right? And it's like, no, he dude. wants it all. No, it's not only he wants back what he had. He wants he back wants crime back. He back wants too. everything. Yeah, and here and here's the thing. That's fine. I you understand. Be realistic though. On, on, a, on a nationalistic level, I totally understand that that frame of mind. And and but also, you have to be a realist and see that you're yes. not able to do that. 
Yes. You're, you're just not able to do it. You've literally proven that. And and look, man, you've lost 200,000 of your own men. You know what's going to happen after this war gets done? It's going to be Ukraine brought to you by, you know, BlackRock and brought, <laughs> brought to you by Morgan Stanley, right? Like the, the, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be like... You know, the, the Morgan oh, Stanley laughing, um, district of Kiev. You know what I mean? It's going to be this. You're going to have to whore out your country. And second of all, you're going to have to bring in men from all over Eastern Europe to populate, repopulate your country because you're not going to have these men to go back to work. To They're not going to have trouble convincing men to come in there. I ain't going to lie. No, like, no. Some but, good talent. But, here, but here's <laughs> the problem. The problem is you lose your national identity. That's true. Right, yeah. because now you're going to have these people, and and they are a very you know nationalistic country. They have great pride in their country. They have great pride in their history and all this kind of stuff. And look, I don't care what they do with their country, but I don't think I have to pay for it. And I don't think my my kids, 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 kids should have to pay for it either. <laughs> right, right. And and that's kind of the thing. It's like, look, you're so against funding at this point. Yeah, you've had your crack at the whip. You can't do it. If I give you another hundred billion. Are you going to be able to do it? If the answer is yes, and you can show me why, how, we can talk now, but you can't do that. So why am I just going to give that to you? I mean, you've literally been on the ground, but everyone I've talked to who seems to have a brain on this stuff, you know, and or room to talk, a knowledge of how it goes down, I don't, I haven't heard a single person say there's even a shot they could do their entire goal, which is get back all of the East and Crimea. Like it doesn't, there's no path to that. They can't take five kilometers. So, yeah. So, I mean, you're telling me what I expected you to tell me, to so, be honest. And but. so here's the deal. Let, let's look at it realistically. Okay. Here's what I'm going to pass across the table to you. Two more years. Two more years? Two more years, a hundred billion dollars. And let's just say... I don't know, whatever's on the guy's wish list, right? How long do we have on the podcast? When's my flight? <laughs> um, and let's just say, let's just say more tanks, whatever that means. So you've got two more years, <sighs> another hundred billion and more tanks until your heart's full of tank fumes, right? What does that do? What does that get you? Pro not the W that they're looking for. So you sit down and make peace. So we sit down and we we do something else, yeah. right? We do something else. And you think an F sixteen is going to make a difference? You think an F sixteen? You think you think what? Twelve? If you get eleven F sixteens, you're going to still lose. But you get twelve, you're it's going to make a difference. Like what's going to make a difference? You can't tell me it's money because you've had money, it hasn't made a difference. You can't tell me it's equipment because you've had not. equipment and it hasn't made the difference. So what's going to make the difference? I mean, if you were talking to your son about this or you were talking to your best friend about this who was struggling with something and say you were trying to save his business and help him save his business, you'd have these simple questions. Yes. What's it going to take? Okay, this. Okay, why do you think this? Show me your plan for this. I can't. Okay, then why am I going to give you that? Yeah, I, dude, I, I think that's... I think that's the, the realest take on it. The, the one thing I keep looking at with this is if you go back to Iraq for a second, the interesting part about that war is that regardless of how we look at it in history now, at the time, there's very bipartisan support for it, right, mm -hmm. when it came out. And so part of me says these people never fucking learn their lessons. But I'm looking now after that and after years and years of the rhetoric from either party actually being like the big mistake of the Iraq war and how we, we can't have these endless wars and whatever. And in the midst of all this, sub 20 years later, this war breaks out and during a way more divided time, bipartisan support. And there, for the most part, with few exceptions on both sides, there's a few holdouts on right. either side publicly as far as people in Congress and Senate. Everyone's on board with this war. It's yeah, very odd to we me. We were talking about this earlier, and I think there's different reasons. I think different groups have different reasons for the bipartisan support. You know what I mean? Um, Moolah? Yeah, it all comes down to money, but yeah. it's just different ways of, of, of money. Um but yeah, I mean, at this point, I think a deal needs to be made. And, and the biggest reason why is it's stopping the killing. Like, I know guys that have been killed. And, you know, I mean, it's war. I've, I've known guys that have been 
killed all over the world, unfortunately, with war. But like, I know guys there that are involved in this and they're not fighting for, I mean, I don't want to say they're not fighting for anything. I don't mean it like that. But what I'm saying is what they were fighting for that day wasn't going to make a difference in the war. Right. Right. They weren't killed on target getting a bomb maker that was responsible for killing 50 U.S. soldiers at some point, right? You go in, okay, we got that guy that night. This guy, you know, got shot or whatever. That's unfortunate, but that makes a difference. It's a bomb maker off the street. I get it. The next one steps right in, but that one's off the street, right? He's out, he's out of the game. Um, that, that, you could argue that doesn't make a lot of sense, but it makes some sense, mm -hmm. right? We're not talking about fighting from me to the other side of the table, and we lose 50 guys in order to get to the other side of the table and drink out of your cup. What does that mean? And then tomorrow we're fighting and you're right back on this side of the table. So you just kind of have to, I mean, I don't really understand what he thinks is going to happen and, and how this is going to play out. I think our objective has been accomplished in this. I think our objective, whether it's been talked about overtly or not, was to weaken the Russian army, expose the Russian... I mean, I think that wasn't an objective, but that's happened, that we have exposed the Russian army as not being the the monster that we have always been told since the Cold War that it was. Um, but we've de certainly decimated or helped decimate the Russian army. I mean, they're using prisoners. They're using prisoners. Right. They're using, you know, people that have been malnourished. They're Fucking using 17-year-old kids right off yeah. the street. So yeah. we're, we've clearly weakened them, right, um, to a massive degree. Um, I just I just don't see how we are on board with this thing continuing from the I, – I mean, I understand the money. I understand there's a lot going on with this. It's easy to get the corruption going and all this, but – from a military standpoint, I don't understand why we're continuing to just pour money down the drain into something that's not working. Well, it's very interesting to hear that from a guy who's literally been there, seeing this up close. And I have so many more questions and so much more to talk with you about, but you got to get the fuck out of here. I think I do, yeah. You have a flight to catch. Be, but it's listen, been a long day. Yeah. Mark, this was awesome. You did an amazing job, especially for a guy on a half hour sleep. <laughs> if you're headed back to Israel this week, Best of luck with that. Stay safe out there. Thank you for going through everything. These were two fucking awesome podcasts, and I'd love to get some more with you down the line. Sure. Again, as you have updates on things you're doing. But Yeah, and thanks for all your support, yeah. you know, and for the opportunity and stuff. I know we've been trying to do this for, for a wee while, and it just kind of hasn't happened, but, you know, it was, you know, this morning was special with that kind of impromptu kind of thing with everything that was happening. And I'm glad we were, you know, I'd be at home driving myself crazy following this stuff. So Nuts. Being, being here has kind of really helped. And, and, you know, I'll just drive myself tomorrow trying to get through it all and, and all, <laughs> all right, that. Well, don't, don't go too crazy. But one, <laughs> last, one last thing, overwatchfoundation.com or .org? It's uh, overwatchfoundationusa.org. Okay. And I then will, all the links are on my like Instagram bio and all that kind of stuff. I will put both links in the description. Okay. Overwatch and Instagram, and people can donate via the Overwatch yes. link, right? Yep. And that's what funds you to be able to do things like this. Yeah, the we world. can't we can't do anything without funds, and that's kind of our biggest that's our biggest need right now is is funding. Okay. I mean, you know, I mean, we need funding for this Israel thing this week, and it's probably going to go on my credit card. So. <laughs> oh shit! All right. Well, we don't want that, and I'm also going to connect you with Ryan Tate too, because yeah, I know be you're good. talking about Africa. I think yep. that'd be really good for you guys to get together. But everybody else, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace.